I think you can speak now. Hello there. My name is Rachel Gianess Middle. Dilbert and Sullivan is my middle name, and my middle name is my last name. And me and Willie, I and William, are here today on behalf of Forbear Theatre to explore the magic of the Gilbert and Sullivan Gilbert. What did I just Gilbert's Gilbert and Sullivan operas by very pedantically ranking every element of them. And today we are discussing something which I am very excited to be discussing with Will about, which is the baritone roles, because Will has probably played all of these, maybe not all of them, most of them, but I have only played one of these roles, so which is the council. That's the only one I've played. And so I am very happy to have Will here today. And I imagine for the most part, Will, deg will degree, will agree, because my, as I was saying to Will yesterday, my opinion of these characters has been very much formed upon our discussions together about these characters. So I imagine we're going to be in agreement. What do you think, Will? Well, I reckon so. Think about the fact that there there is a few of these characters we've done together in either productions we were in on the same time or that you directed me in or what have you. Um, and also, I think we have a pretty good handle on this one because we've already done baritone arias. So we've already spoken quite extensively about these characters vis-a-vis uh, -vis their arias before. Mm -hmm. And we did end up with an interesting consensus for the top couple arias on that list. I feel like that we, we were pretty much spot on. So I think for this one, I've seen the scores. You haven't. I won't spoil anything. But I think we are going to find that this is a, another one of those lists where we're not fighting. You know, we're just going, ah, oh, we love these baritones. And... The really good ones are hard to argue with, I think. So, yeah. um, at least for us. And so, if there's a couple of these that you feel like, I don't know about that, but we both place them really high or whatnot, it's probably because of um, our shared performance experience in them. But there's definitely a cluster in the middle where I think things are less clear. And there are some characters that I literally have no idea what you think about at all. Things like Mantara and Florian. I've never, we've never discussed those characters. So I, I don't know. I could tell you. I don't know one, what you think. One of them is good and one of them is less good. Okay, because I because I just picked those out of thin air because they were right next to each other. So yeah. in my list, they were right next to each other. So, oh. Anyway. I, I think there's going to be um, a couple of little discussions, but I, I don't even see the ones that, the ones that we have far off from each other. I don't see these as being ones that either of us are going to fight about. So. Okay. I think I think this might be a nice relaxing tea time treat. Oh. Well, let's get into it. Um, we have 26 roles, which is a lot of roles. It's a lot of roles. And so with that in mind, we're going to be It's like a quick. bakery. It's a lot of roles in a bakery. <laughs> we need to be quick, Will. Come on. Number 26 is a very interesting character. And I think you can explain a little bit about why this is a baritone role, because some people might go, I thought that was a bass part. And it is the notary in the sorcerer. So I think for anybody who's not up to speed, explain what's going on here. Because even though the notary and very deaf old man are typically played by the same person, they're not actually meant to be played by the same person. And they do actually have quite different ranges. I mean, the notary barely sings at all, but the very deaf old man at least has some kind of motivation and character. But this is probably the most nothingish role I've discussed so far in any of these videos. He literally just is part of a process and he has no character or any motivation whatsoever. Now, I, I think I have a couple of thoughts about this. First of all, um, if you look at the score, first of all, most people are looking at the 1884 revised version, wherein Dear Friends Take Pity on My Lot is higher, a higher key by a minor third. Oh, it's, quite, okay. it's quite higher. So uh, the opposite rather, it's lower. Um, 1884, Jesse oh, Bond. Oh, right. Yeah, that would make more sense because, yeah, Jesse Bond. Yeah. Jesse Bond plays um, mm -hmm. Constance, and it's lowered from E to D flat, which is quite mm -hmm. a jump. 
and that the deaf old man part now has to like be in the basement whereas when you do it in e the deaf old man actually like i don't think it's that common that i hear a deaf old man nail those notes when it's in the low key um it's it's pretty nice in the high key i think that the revisionism might say that we should do it in the high key and I would say that there are fewer mezzos out there than sopranos. And a lot of times Constance, who still needs that banging high A in the opening and a banging high B in the act one finale, like probably is a soprano anyway. All this is to say in whatever edition, um, you, Sullivan uses a different clef for the two characters. And he's a bass in act two, bass clef, and a treble clef in act one. Mm. And a treble clef usually will denote baritone or tenor role. And he usually only yep. uses bass for the bass characters. This is, I mean, we, we've fudged some of these arrangements too based on historical uh, casting and whatnot. But um, with all this being said, um, the very deaf old man, who sometimes is the oldest living inhabitant, which we've seen that in some dramatis personae over the years, um, definitely is separate. And if that's the case, I wonder if we've done this character a disservice, but I do think you're right in that they are very different. and. I have seen people play this opening notary very differently than the act two iteration, but let's also remember there's a love potion involved. All this being said, um, this, this, if this is what we're taking as the act one guy who would also sing in the basement of um, Marvelous Illusion, but that's okay. I would say a big ensemble, it's an octet, you know, it's got, it's all the whole, uh, no, it's more than that. I'll let you tell me how many people are sing solos in that. So is it a nine tet? Yeah, I don't know. I don't even know. I've, yeah, because because yeah. Wells is there. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was thinking of Act Two finale with the two quartets. Uh, but then, but then oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because then you can add just the one guy. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, the, technically the notary sings in that octet at the end. So is that the is that the deaf old man or is that the notary? That's a good point. I, has, I don't know. I actually sings, can't remember. He sings the bass harmony under Daly and yeah, and uh, Partlet Let's and Con see. Constance. Because what does the score actually say? Like the dramatis personae. Let's see. Well, it's going to be say the notary. I think wherever you go. I think I think we've um, already failed in our task to to be quick about. Yeah, that. it just says that. It actually just says notary. Um in the Bradley. Well, well, let's 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 um, remember the clock and let's decide that we should not tarry. Yeah, but um, anyway, there's not really much to discuss about this character. I gave him a 5 for music out of 20. I gave him a 5 for lyrics slash dialogue and this time I kind of included the comedy mark within the lyrics and dialogue because usually their di usually the baritone's dialogue is pretty funny. So I included the comedy mark there, gave him a two for emotional dramatic impact also out of 20 and a one out of 10 for press. I said presence in narrative rather than importance because some of these characters, they're not like vital to the story, but they just have a lot of presence and actually only maybe two or three of them are really important to the story. So I change uh, importance to presence for this one. But then enjoyment, yeah, I gave a one, because it's just, I, I, if, if you were literally just singing that bit, I that is not a part, that is probably my least favorite part on the list, for sure. Yeah. Um, I like that number though. I think that it's got yeah. beautiful four part harmony and it's got- it's, uh, Hey, it's it's my showstopper. It's it's the it's one of the sorcerer showstoppers. Yeah, um, I think. I'm, uh, well, yeah, it's interesting for me because you gave this total score of fourteen, which is sixteen points away from your next score. So it's a quite a big uh, drift. I have only um, this is actually not my last. Wait, it is my. What the? Surely it must be your last place. Wait, that doesn't make it. Uh, that's a mistake. I made a mistake. It is my second to last place. Okay. And. I mean, okay, so I have to fix that. Okay, fixed. That's my 25th place. Um, so I'm going to try again what I did before. So I think that given the time constraints, we should not tarry. 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 Oh! Sorry, that took me. We should no tarry. We should we should no tarry. Say it yourself. See if you can make we it work. Should... 
I think that since we have time constraints today, we should notary tar. We should notary. <laughs> We should not tarry. We should, no we should tarry. not tarry. Yeah, no okay. Tarry. Okay, so who's next? It's Apollo from Vespas. <laughs> okay. Apo Apollo from Vespas, who um, you ranked. He was my fourth from bottom. Yeah. Oh, I see what I need to do again. Okay. Um, he's my he's my last. Okay. And why I is he so? Why is he? Because lesbian? what does he do? He's one of the dudes. But he's got quite funny lines, you know, when I was a younger son. You know, he, he, he is quite a character. He does, even though his line, his dialogue is not the best, uh, we don't know what music he had exactly, but he does have like a, like a fair amount of music. Like not, it's not, he doesn't have an aria, but he has like way, way more music than a character's I put I, below him. I think I'm in, in my defaulting position that Vespa's characters. Yeah. I have to. Because, like, Mars is the one that has, like, barely anything. Apollo actually has, like, a relatively la large amount of dialogue. And he has, he has a really great kind of conversation with Diana and Mercury at the start. And he he's actually, the stuff to play with there, even if the material isn't great, I think the right actor can make, you know, a fair amount out of this part. He's cute. He's like I, a kind I, of he's like a vain older guy who's just like lost well, a bit I, of a I, his luster over the years. He's I like I like him more than Jupiter and Mars, and yeah. and I think um, our fellow who played him nine years ago uh, was so wonderfully preening in the part. He was so great. Totally, to <laughs> totally got what this should be. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I I know that you we've sort of defaulted to the Baker Henty. Which, with the music that Apollo gets to sing, is mostly from Orpheus and from mm. Utopia Limited, um, okay. those first two big solos. But uh, you know, he's a good, he's a good egg, um, and uh, I wish him well. Yeah, fine. We don't have to uh, say much more about it. No, well, least. so up, up yeah. next, up next is somebody <laughs> who really does deserve a fairer shake. But this is such a strong list, and it's poor Mr. Blushington. Mr. Aww. Blushington, who who um might actually sh there's a, I'm a little stressed about all this. Mr. Blushington might actually belong on the tenor list, but but he's like he is very bar baritonal. Like the, mm. these roles are all a little funny, and a lot of times it can just sort of depend on who played them originally. Tell me what you think about Mr. Blushington. I think that Mr. Blushington has some of the best music in the show. I only gave him a 10 out of 20 because he only sings in one point, which is one of the five best moments of the show, which is the wonderful waltz in the middle of the act one finale. And he also gets, he gets the final line of that little section where all the guys are like saying the things they're going to do to the king. And he says, widen your thoroughfares and flush your drains. <laughs> and there's, there's a lot you can do with him as a character, even though he's only on for that short time. Uh, we had someone really amazing playing for Savoyna and put a, like, an accent on him. In towns I make improvements great. <laughs> And was, uh, I can't do accents, but it was funny. And like, it's this. There, there are things you can do with this music. There are, you have enough time here to do something with him as a character. But I only gave him second from bottom because he just has so little. But then again, he is a society that's quite forsaken, which is a fun number to be in. And so I'd say that even though you wouldn't notice him much as an audience member, you probably would have quite a good time playing this part because he does have like a bit of presence. I actually, I gave, well, I, you know what? I gave him a two for presence in narrative, which actually I think I probably should have given him larger because he is one of the flowers and they as a unit are actually pretty present. So maybe that was unfair, but um, I, I don't really feel like he as an individual really has any stakes. No, I, I, I think that if I were to audition for this show, you'd if it's a baritone type person, you'd probably want to get like Goldberry, maybe mm. even Dramalee if you want to do that. Yeah, so I, I, I will tell you the, the Fock situation here. The, the originator of Blushington is Herbert Rowland, who also with the cart uh, in other touring companies and such played 
Fairfax, Marco, and Fitzbattleax. So oh, one, okay. one, one could argue right. that, that we've, we've uh, put him in the wrong list. But the thing is, oh, um, I do remember when our buddy Alan played him for us at Utopia a couple months ago. Um, it does say in Eagle High, Blushington with tenors at the start. Oh. And then, um, but even Sullivan sometimes will be like, but then in another number you're with basses. Mm -hmm. But then Eagle High, if those of you have ever sung Eagle High, you can't just do it as SATB because there are always notes that only one member of the cast is singing or like two. Like Lady Sophie has a very unique line, Blushington and Sir Bailey Barr and Dromley and Paramount. They've all got notes, Corcoran and Goldberry, they've all got notes that only they sing. Mm. And in this um, manner, Blushington and Dromley have quite a high part. And we had two baritones in those roles. And it was really fun because it meant that we needed fewer tenors because having baritones sing tenor parts, they'll always be louder. So yeah. it was sort of a, it was a, it was a fait accompli as it were, that we had a, a good blend uh, and they blended very well and they didn't push too yeah. hard. Uh, but my yeah. thoughts on Blushington, yeah. I mean, I think the waltz is, as you know, one of my favorite parts of the show. Mm. And, and I think that, um, uh, the opportunities for Blushington are many. Any role in Utopia has many opportunities and should should all be taken. Um, but we love Blushington. He's good. And now we come on to a character that I feel like, I feel like, though I ranked 23 and you ranked 24, I feel like I want, I'm surprised it's not higher for you for personal reasons, which is Silamon. Yeah, the thing is, you playing him, I have excellent memories of, but but then like but then it's actually similar to Mercury because when I when I did my Thespis dialogue video and I went back and actually looked at Cinnamon's dialogue and Mercury's dialogue, I was like, wow, me and you did a really good job. <laughs> It's like the, the the dialogue is not great. It really, really isn't. Yeah. It's, it, I, I, I think me and you found something in those characters that I, I don't know if it was intended. I, I have no idea, but it is not great dialogue. And he does, he only has one tiny bit of music, doesn't he, Cinnamon? Well, uh, yeah, there's, if we also know that in your dialogue video, you were operating under the original libretto, which had more With preposterous characters. and stupid ass, yeah. Which, so, so and, I, well, I, and actually some of Cinnamon's best lines were actually preposterous as Right, lines. so in, in the yeah. Baker Henty performing edition, Cinnamon was changed. I will never forget going up to Tony Baker after that performance in 2014. And he says to me uh, something to the effect of, I didn't realize that was a good part. And he had seen this, like the productions of this edition before. So I don't know if that meant that previous performers of Silamon went like, oh, well, I'm not playing a lead. I'm just gonna like do a serviceable yeah, job. Yeah, yeah, maybe. But I will yeah. say that also Gary's direction, I mean, I got to basically be the train song, which was a, a, a reward. But yeah, I mean, I had opportunities all over the place. I was yeah. given permission to ad lib. I think that in that performing performance, there's like four things I say that aren't in the lib. Um, that are ad libs I made at some point in the rehearsal process. And the singing um, Silamon does in that edition actually has fewer words, I remember. Uh, to work and play, my dears, would be the height of uh, un uh, unconscientious folly. Like, there's like an extra few syllables that Baker and Henty were like, ah, it just put it to Cox and Box and they cut, they cut it out. Um, but I had a good time with that. I think that Silamon has a wonderful little arc at the beginning of Act Two, where um, I mean, I again, I b b did as much as I could because it's very unclear what his emotional prospects are, but it's clear that he's attracted to all of the ladies and that he's mm. happy that they mm. think that he's a dear old thing. Um, and I was so happy you played that in like a non-predatory way. Because I can see how somebody could take those lines and make that really gross. Mm. And so I'm very happy with the way that you played that. Well, the good news is um, I don't go about fashioning gross. I'm not a gross smith. Oh! 
I'm not a yeah, like a like a blacksmith. <laughs> I enjoyed that one. That yeah, was really good. good. Um, but yeah, I had a little thing between me and and um, Sparky, and where like I clearly had a crush on one of the girls that he was into, and then when he was like, um, like the, like I don't know. Everybody just watch the GS Opera TV video. Watch the opening like ten minutes of Act Two, which is the opening number and then a little dialogue and the little maid of Arcady and then Rachel comes on and Rachel does her song. Silva we has... had a fun little bit, didn't we? We did like a little ad lib and, and what of the what what of the something that sh what of the baker that sugars the cakes or something and you went, I don't know. Yeah, that's good. That was a good ad lib I liked. <laughs> Um, that was so, funny. So Silamon is given the privilege, and I will say it's a privilege, though it can be thankless at times, to be a silent party to two consecutive arias, which is very, it's so strange because it's like Sparky and Don sings an aria, leaves, Silamon left alone, then you come on, sing an aria, and, uh, and then <laughs> Thespis comes on and is like, go, I've seen you do it now, go. And then like Silamon should have like a button at the end of that scene. But he doesn't. And I think that there's no. something really tragic about that that I enjoyed playing. And, and let's just remember, in spite of the dialogue being a little naff, you and I both won awards for these roles. We, yeah, I think we, we did were, actually. I yeah, think we yeah, were yeah. singled out. That show was singled out. It was the runner up that year for being like, oh my God, I didn't realize Thespis could be fun. Yeah. And people. I think like we Thespis. Cool. Um, there's there's a there's definitely like a video I want to make which I haven't actually scheduled but I think actually this is the more I get to love kind of trial by jury and thespis the more I think I want to make a video at some point to like ranking like how GNS -y they are Oh, like how yeah. zany they are but, and then like but, and, and how to qualify that because honestly that would be a really good chance for things like thespis pirates who haven't maybe been doing so well like because that's what makes them so good what makes the and trial by jury what makes these ones in particular so good is that they're just so like fast-paced and zany and so like what was going on off the wall grand duke as well it's just and and like that is what a lot of people would consider like the very heart of Gilbert and Sullivan, like especially as it, as it manifests itself in Pirates. Like that dialogue in Pirates is just crazy. It's so funny, but it's so different to, you know, Rudigal. It, but it's it's got such a value. And I think I need to make sure that I need to find a way of expressing that value. Most GNSC GNS. Yeah, I I think that that's <laughs> that's that's fair. Uh, I think there are elements of Despis that are incredibly un GNSC in terms of structure, but then you'll see uh, well, parts yeah. of it that are like I oh, don't know. No, that's clearly a, what that is. Like yeah. you could tell what's a pattery type song. There's lots of patter songs in it. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's 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 say that Silamon gets an A. Um, Silamon, but the thing is. Again, he's one of these parts that, like, like any part can steal the show. If you've got a good enough actor, a good enough director, and you make them do something fun well, well, that's, that's interesting. I, but, like, I, but the thing is, like, like that is just always the absolute best case scenario. And any of those roles have the chance to do that. And you did that with Silamon. But, I mean, do we think that that's easy to do? I think not. Oh, my God, no. I, th yeah. th 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 I had to think... Like, what does this mean? <laughs> there was a lot of lines that I'm like, what does this mean? Yeah. Um, a lot of, a lot of it was, was just trusting that you could just say the words. And it was my first time acting in GNS in an American accent as per Gary's request. Um, so he's like, what is there for me? You have claret cup and lobster salad. Like, like those kinds of lines are, line. are just, line. just in it. But I don't remember who that, maybe that's not me originally. Anyway, let's move on to another role that I think we recently saw stole a lot of the show, which was Tarara. Yeah, I couldn't believe Tarara was so low. It's and just, I, and it, that I makes think me really sad. No, I think I think he's, we have a lot of roles that are gonna be in this upcoming category, which are, mm. they're just too small. And but honestly, like I love, I 100% love every single role from now until the end. Well, yeah, I, they're all good. I absolutely um, love this. So, I love so, Tarawa. He sings in a, a Wiley Bray, which is one of my favorite GNS songs. So let's talk about Tarara for a second. Um, Tarara's opening dialogue is garbage. 
Oh, it man. is. It is a dumpster fire. And if you listen, Rachel has a way of being very diplomatic. I, your Princess Ida video is a masterclass of 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 empathy and diplomacy all at once. But I'm just going to tell you that if you want to come and tell me that there isn't something horribly creepy about that whole first scene with Tarara, then I don't know. Maybe you should go uh, go get renew your colonialism uh, membership card because mm. it is creepy. And the yeah. fact that like. Yeah, I know utopian is not a real language, but the fact that it's got like poo in it again, Gilbert, other cultures don't just speak pee pee poo poo. Like that's not how it works. What is wrong with you, Breda? Breda get your head checked. Oh, but it's, it's different to the, to the way I speak and therefore very funny. Exactly right. So Gilbert, Tarara, um, no, but we did write a new scene for Tarara for this past production, which we're still it workshopping, was so good. Uh, which was a scene for him and the two wise men. The formulation uh, was that the girls had the, the, the trio. There's a little trio dialogue. We gave Phil a line. So as you know, Phil has no lines. We gave Phil some lines. They said their lines. Callings was out of the show. Goodbye, Callings. And um, then we went right into the wise men. We didn't have Tarara come in and have that terrible scene with Callings, truly terrible. Instead, Tarara and the wise men have a scene after uh, In Every Mental Lore, where Tarara's like, I got this paper here, what's going on? As opposed to him being like, Callings, a character we'll never see again, let me impart in onto you my frustrations about what I see in this paper. And yeah. I just have to say that like, that exchange of, like are, like, are you familiar with the palace peep or whatever? And Callings' line, never even heard of the journal, just sets my teeth on edge. It's Wait, so, so like, so in the original, mm. Tarara is only seen with Scafio and Fantas for the first time in the Act 1 finale. That is correct. So, so that he basically has like no arc with them. That's bizarre. Right, it's, and... it's, this is vital to just make this, this, like the scene that you have written needs to just become canon. Yeah, um, because it will, is so vastly better. I than will credit the that really, was a, really racist. That was Natan. <laughs> Natan wrote that, but we we spent like a couple weeks emailing back and forth about what needs to be in the scene and like what are we trying to accomplish. There were certain elements about like like the, in that scene we managed to make Tarara the wise men and the king's relationship all so much clearer than Gilbert ever did. Mm. And I do think yeah. that um, that made the character of Tarara really fun for the actor to play. And he was- Oh, he was so funny. That scene, I, that scene oh. became like, like, I don't think, I'm sorry. I don't think it's possible to make the opening scene with Tarara and Kalanx good. I, I, I just do no. not think, unless you cut out all the utopian and um, maybe cut out Kalanx and have Tarara just talk to us. Like if Tarara just comes out and explains to us the situation, it'll be much, Gilbert will soon as hide the, exposition in dialogue between two people but then that means two people have to talk which means the scene takes twice as long it can be it could just be a soliloquy yeah. but you know you know when lady blanche goes i should command here but i don't it could be like that all the lights can go dark and you just yeah. see tarara just like turn to the audience and speak yeah, yeah there's, there's things you can do to get around that but yeah i agree that the character of Kalinx is pointless and racist or like rather they are a vehicle for racism yeah well i mean it this shows a little bit um i i we couldn't cut ulalika though i didn't know what to do i we could have replaced it with that's very good ulalika is that's yeah i mean someone's gonna have good. to yeah and the thing is though Ulalika. i i feel like ulalika <laughs> is is a really delightful sounding word ulalika i know and to, 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 to me that seems kind of quite triumphant and it seems based on other kind of expressions of joy. I, I like it, it doesn't. It doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like it was designed to poke fun in the same way that the um, other words were. Yeah, the only thing that's 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 it's it, it's an ululation. So if you have any issues with ululations, oh, you can, you can, you can right, tell us. I hadn't made that connection. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, lala balele to lala kalalele poo. Just get mm. Gilbert. Go to take a bath. <laughs> Let's move on. Yes. 
Um, yeah, love him, but yeah. But so, he's, he's got great music, though. He's got some really great music. Oh, my God, yeah. Yeah, um, so. Let's talk about Major Murgatroyd. So Ma- Major- Is he Mur- next? Well, he's, he's 21, and that's my rank. I have 21, okay. you have 18. 18. This is not that he's far. He's my 18, you know, yeah, it's fine. I'm, oh, like, I, I'm happy with him being there. Do you know what? I, th- I think my reasons for him being a little lower are kind of like your reasons for Silimon, which is like, we had a very good Major Murgatroyd when we did it. Somebody who was like, I'm going to make these lines funny. He has like yeah. not, seven or eight lines, and they all can be funny. Major Murgatroyd has like, he's a character that nothing, he, no material he does is weak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but then but then thinking about it, I actually now you bring it up, I actually have seen some productions of Patience where I've not even noticed the major. Exactly Isn't right. Isn't that funny? It's it's no, it's it's true. Uh, I I remember yeah. one. I bucks it in twenty twelve that the major Murgatroyd was the funniest guy of the three guys, and I could just tell from from the way he carried himself. But it's, it is tough to be the major because if you try to be the best major that ever was, is there a point at which you'll pull focus? Mm. Like if you try to be like, I'm going to be the funny one. Whereas the, a really great major to me um, has two great lines in the quintet scene. I wonder what the us- inner brother would usually recommend for cramp and I wish they'd make haste, which needs to be so carefully delivered in order to have maximum impact. And... Yeah. You know, it's that, that could be a challenge, but um, I think that the major um, has one luxury, which is he has those wonderful middle harmonies to sing. And I've played the major in oh, co- yeah, concert nice. yeah. multiple times. So I, I've yeah. never played the major, but I've sung the major's music. And I love his harmonies in soft note and in the trio. He's got like wonderfully juicy lines that... Um, are the hardest to sing those those very crunchy middle middle spots, especially because it's this kind of thing where like when you've got B B T A S S, we can argue um, as the soft note distribution. That means that the the second the the, the upper bass, the baritone, Merger Murgatroyd, he's gonna be like in a very low spot in his range, so that he's under the tenor, but then kind of high, so he's not <laughs> above the bass. And mm-hmm. under the bass and with that being the case he has a lot of like sitting on this d blah, 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 which is a very gentle note it's the fact it's fact it's, it's a soft note that's what it is yeah. um, but when you've got this note and you're like how hard do you want to hit hit that note it's always an interesting question because you can't really like uh, pl- uh, bang too hard on those but um He's great. I think he's a good guy. And, um, you know, I, I, I wish more for him. I, I think that, um, yeah. but I, I think, I think you're right. I was thinking about our guy playing him when for bed patients back in 2019. And honestly, but the thing is he didn't steal the show because we also had a great Duke and Colonel as well. They were all great. And they all just ha- worked as such an amazing team. But there are a couple of moments that the major got, which is, I think he was the last to exit in the quintet and he he, he like lost control of his feet and he was like doing- Oh, the thing yes. There. And, and just like, he just had occasional moments where he really shone, but it wasn't focus pulling because they all had moments and they were all great. So like he was never, he was never stealing someone else's moment, but I just made sure that that every single moment was utilized in some way for one of the characters, at least, or if not all of them. And also this medieval art was so good. I'm a great director, actually, because I, w- I recently watched that Patience and it I, it was really well directed. You well, should, that is one of my, my favorite shows I've done. I, I would and agree. I, 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 it was a very, it was absolute joy to um, get to watch that show from the pit. I really loved it. Let's move on to The Herald. Which the Herald! Ranked, ranked 20. You ranked you ranked 19, I ranked 20. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, went, I, I was surprised with how high he came, but I was just thinking of like, doing the Grand Duke last week, uh, or two weeks ago, um, and every single night, I, the Herald, at the end of his song, that was every single night, it was the loudest applause of the night. People go nuts for that song. And there's also, it's just, 
like, like the guy playing him was absolutely awesome, but it's also kind of quite easy to make the Herald really awesome. And like, cause he's, he's, it's a gift. It's a gift of a part. It's an absolute scene stealing, potentially show stealing role. Uh, even though it's so small and he Correct. has just like one of the best songs in the country. Could you imagine, could you imagine a world where anybody was without their marbles enough to cut any part of this number? I, 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 I literally can't imagine that world. I don't, I, I can't, like, I'm trying to hear what it would sound like in my head and it definitely sounds like a mess. Because honestly, uh, um, and this is another video we have to make, can like just me and you and maybe other people as well, just counting down our personal top 10 favorite musical moments in the canon. And I'm telling you now that that the Prince of Monte Carlo has left us that you know he's here to restore his beautiful daughter. To me, that is definitely one of my top 10 moments in the canon. That's good. With all the- Could you imagine, could you, could you imagine though, like what if there was a production, just what if, where they not only cut part of that number, but they took the chorus out of that moment. Could you imagine? That would be weird, wouldn't it? That would be yeah. really strange. I it can't would, imagine that. At if all. I if, if I was playing Ludwig in that production, I would feel so naked on stage if, if that happened. So uh, yeah, I'd love to play the Herald. I've never played the Herald, and um, it's, I mean, oh well, you would. Uh, that would be so good. That would be fun. That would be, uh, that would be really really good. The Herald, you know, that. the Herald gets his own harmony line in the following yeah. number. Yeah. Uh, rigged out magnificent array. And otherwise, that's really all the Herald is. But again, it's another yeah. pound for pound, like 100% of the role is good. Yeah, it's yeah, because, yeah, so he doesn't get, the, the thing is, like, obviously he loses in places like emotional dramatic impact, because even though his song is really dramatic, I gave him a 13 for that, which is super generous, considering he's not in the least bit emotional at all, throughout, you know, throughout his track. Um, I only gave him a 10 for lyrics, dialogue, comedy, because he's just not present. Yeah, another a three for presence and narrative. But then, you know what? I think I, I, get, I gave him, though, uh, I gave him a seven for enjoyment. Good. Do you, do, because, hey. Okay. His, his aria oh came pretty high on the arias list. So I it almost was my feel like three. I think it became number five overall for us. So I feel like it's funny that like if that's almost his entire role, that is ninety percent of his role. Maybe he should yeah. be third place. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Beat was so good. Um, anyway, I I love this next guy though. I've ranked him nineteen, and you ranked him seventeen. This is Sir Richard Chumley. Ah. Which, which um, uh, I'd love to play Sir Richard Chumley. I never have. I've done. I've sang him in concert, and. Yeah. I think that he is kind of the definition of a role that is thankless unless you like try really hard. And if mm. you try really hard, your goal should not be to pull focus. So you have to like, like I don't think that a successful Sir Richard Chumley is necessarily the same as one where somebody leaves going, wow, that show was that Lieutenant, that was my favorite guy in the show. Oh but, God, no! Because yeah, yeah, he's would, not really would, meant to be that kind of part, right? But he is yeah. incredibly um, detailed, and having sung him, I think that there are details that are often often overlooked. Mm. Uh, his dialogue with Jack Point is an all timer for me. I, I love that dialogue. I because he's so dry, and it's actually and to me it reads like the the same way that that um, the Mikado could be played like. Yes, that's all very interesting. And I wish I'd been in time for the performance, but we actually came about a completely different matter. It's this, it's that like, it's that dryness. Yes, I think that manner of thing might become a little irritating. It, yeah. it's, it's, it's so dry. And, and I, and I can, I can, I got, I always get such a kick out of the Lieutenant when, when, when the Lieutenant, when the actor playing him obviously understands how funny that is, I get such a kick out of watching that. Absolutely. It's great. I think that um, I remember the first time I did Yeoman, I directed it and played Jack Point, and um, both of the lieutenants were so far from being word perfect on that dialogue oh. that it just like it always made that scene like mm. the ball is in the lieutenant's court. As the the patter guy in that scene, you aren't mm. the only one getting laughs, and you have to know that you're setting up the lieutenant. And I think that's a moment where you'd go. Um, underdone cannot be helped and you hold it yeah i see 
Like you can really take I your see. time with it. Yeah. Like, like, like his weird robot brain. Cause he's like, I don't know. He's like a, he's, he's a cop. Yeah. So he's not going to get he's it. He's like, like, he's, he's like a normal person who's ended up in a Gilbert and Sullivan opera. See, I like that, but he is. And, he that, is and, and that is really funny. There's something really funny about that. And so like, he, he is a I piece of work great. though. I mean, he does have a joke. He has to joke yeah. at the beginning of the trio. He does say a joke. Yes, that is true, actually. About about. He bridegrooms. also says, "What is what is this pother? What is what is this pother? Um, what is yeah. this? What our, is our, this pother? <laughs> our guy, one of our guys in 2012, when he's supposed to say, "Away with ye, clear the rabble," he went, "Get out of here, all of you. Go, move, move," which is so <laughs> not the line. <laughs> So far, uh, we've all been in productions of the people that think that the lines are a suggestion, particularly when they're a little more perfunctory, like those types of lines. So, um, uh, but yeah, I've I love singing his line in the trio. I've now got to do both the, the point and Chumley lines in that trio, and they're both really gratifying. You must sing the right notes, by the way, Jack Point. You must sing that E flat. You know the one I'm talking about. Does and, the lieutenant have much in the Act One finale? Yeah. So the oh, left he has that little exchange with Wilfred, doesn't he? Well, so the lieutenant technically doesn't have a solo until things go to hell in a handbag in the at the end. Though we've mm. put him on in the earlier portions, just because for extra voice. Yeah. And um, but then he says, "Astounding news: the prisoner he fled." The prisoner fled. And then he sings no. all of that. Now the cool thing the lieutenant does is he's the only person that goes up at the very end. Oh, Ooh. dead! He goes up at the end of that. Um, mem if memory serves, Point might also in the edition where Point has the separate lyrics, but maybe that is an editorial choice. I might be making that mm -hmm. up, but Chumley does for sure. And <laughs> once I learned that, I'm always listening out for it. The one voice in the whole huge c column of sound that goes, oh, dead and goes up to the uh, middle C as opposed to down. Mm -hmm. um, Chumley then, I uh, mean, he obviously has some stuff in uh, Who Fired That Shot. I think that he has one of the hardest moments to bring in as a conductor, which is to this attend without undue delay. So sad to work. You, the, oh, the, yeah. The strings and the singer need to be in complete agreement on the, the and uh, it's pretty much impossible sometimes. And then yeah. he has... Thy husband lives and he is free, which those notes are always approximated, so be careful. And, uh, and then he sings in, Come dry these unbecoming tears, most... How, how did I know? That's the right note. That was good. Come dry yeah. these unbecoming tears, most joyful tidings greet thine ears, the man to whom thou... Come dry these unbecoming tears, most joyful tidings greet thine ears, the, 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 the. The matter whom thou art allowed a piece of claim the as his bride. Oh my god. The matter whom thou art allowed a piece of claim the as his bride. As his bride, which is again always fudged. And it's Wilfred uh, Merrill and Lieutenant. And um that's another so he's spot. Got, that's complex. He's Super got complex. like some complex music to yeah. learn. Yeah, music that is And I've so, never yeah. even noticed that. And that's thankless about it. Like that's why yeah. I def I've definitely it's seen amazing. productions where Merrill Point and Wilfred severally or all together didn't even know they sang those. And I've watched their them, their mouths are just standing there completely still. And I'm like, you know, you have a Sullivan wrote a part here. Um, I do want to ask if anybody knows in the 1964 Doily Cart recording, I can't hear those parts at all. And I wonder if there was ever an MD who said they actually get in the way if you hear them because they kind of do. Uh, I'm my jury's out on whether or not they, they make sense because I, I rarely ever hear them sung like spot on and they do get swallowed by everything else. But I wonder if anybody else has ever just cut them out right. But anyway, mm. I think that Richard Chumley is a nice guy. He's a chum to you right. and chum to me. And we should move but, you on. Know, essentially, he's not like, he's not the most emotional, dramatic or enjoyable character to play. But, you know, I think most people would want to give him a crack at some point. And actually, his music is far more complex and interesting than I realized. So. He's in my category of characters, which will be the same for the next one, for sure. Which are, if the rehearsal process was short, I would love to do a full production of it. Yeah. Like, it's the kind of role that, like, if it's, like, a three, four-month process, you're like, I, I can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's a week or two, you know, somewhere where you pull pick up the show real quick, I love that. Um, mm -hmm. Next is King Hildebrand at rank 18. Oh. Um, oh, wow. So we've still not talked about my, is it 22 and 21? 
20 and 21. Wow, 2021. So um, King King Hildebrand, we've you've talked about really well the, in your dialogue video about the fact that he is not a nice guy, but I think that as a character that makes him very interesting to play. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I made a point of including some years ago in my solo show, which mm -hmm. in this recent rendition of it became like a weird little um, like vocal and emotional highlight because I had just done O oh Foolish Fay. And I had just done at the outset, I may mention both of which were a little more effete and whimsical in their own different ways, uh, yeah. a, little, a little more femme. And then I go full butch for King Hildebrand. And so that I was like, oh yeah, like I, this guy just being like a nasty piece of work is really quite alluring in terms of like that. Mm. And, and I, then I thought about it carefully. I'd love to see my, my rank here for this music. A 15, which because yeah, my, me too. I gave him a 15. I think that Hildebrand's music, uh, I think his opening song is obviously nothing. Uh, he sings two phrases in each verse, and the chorus sings most of it. It's one of those, right? But mm. um, we didn't include it in Baratonarius for that reason, I believe, because um, it's more chorus than solo. But his music in the act one finale, a little bit, the act two finale, especially, I mean, that Sullivan's beautiful. Um, section for the 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 three dudes and Hildebrand. I rather think I dare, but never, never mind. Release Hilarion then and be as bright. Like all of that is. Spot oh, you're, on. oh my god! I forgot about that. Your link of the guilt of fratricide. Oh uh, my god! What a so dude. good. So yeah, I mean, he doesn't. Hey, have... by the way, did you did you agree with our um? Finale rankings of Yeoman beating Princess Ida Act Two finale. Yes, Yo, um, uh, yeah. I, I actually if, like the Princess Ida one better. But, yeah. Well, the Princess Ida Act Two finale is yeah. a right banger, and um, and there are parts of it that I think that revealed itself to me more when we watched it last year at the festival, mm. namely those big pizzicatos, <laughs> nothing and dismay us. Room. Like they are so much funnier in an actual theater than they are on a recording. Oh, yeah. The way the pits reverberates. But I've always considered the Act 1 finale of Yeoman to be my number one GNS number of all time. And uh, yeah, I, yeah, that's fair. And I do, I have, a, I have an experience yeah. where I once was with somebody in high school and we were driving around and I sat in a parking lot of a train station and I said, you're listening to this. And I put on the Act 1 finale of Yeoman. I just sat in the driver's seat going like, oh, they didn't get it, but that's okay. <laughs> I don't think that's the ideal way to experience a piece of musical theater. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, the um, King Elderbrand, uh, cracking music. Um, some of the dialogue is a little, little rough around the edges, but um, I actually do. Yeah, because like there was something, there was something that I didn't know if this was kind of an inconsistency or if it was a deliberate choice on Gilbert's part. But the fact that he says in one scene, "Oh, we we'll live." She's decided to kind of lock herself in a castle and, you know, and ignore all men. And it seems that you've had a lucky escape. Obviously, that's not the line. I can't remember what the line is, but he kind of insinuates to Hilarion that it's not really a big deal if Princess Ida doesn't come. But then he's the one that invades because it's not about Princess Ida or him wanting her for his son. It's just a, it's purely about control. So that's pretty cool. I, I, so I didn't know, I thought at first, oh, that's a bit of a mistake, but actually I don't think it's a mistake. I think it's just showing like how toxic he is. And the thing is that there's, and there's, and there's a lot you can do with characters like this, because like, there's a lot of, like, I would imagine just playing him like super calm, but just showing how like toxic and aggressive that calmness can be. You know how like, women get this um, reputation of being hysterical and emotional when like a man is remaining really calm, but like, oh my God, sometimes men being calm is so threatening. Think of some years you ago, know, completely like, oh, still. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That gives me chills. It properly gives me chills thinking of that song.
Do you um? I, that, that's a top tier number. That is. Do you think mm -hmm. um? You think he's a villain? The thing is, I wouldn't say he's not obstructing the heroes getting what they want. So he's not a true. He's, so he, I wouldn't say he's an antagonist, but then there's not really antagonists in Prince of Cider. It's just not really like that classic kind of narrative structure. Is he? I just think that he's a very realistic guy who's bad. And he's probably one of the most flawed. I would say Alexis is probably my most flawed character, but he's, you know, and then Princess Sara, as we were talking about when I did it, she's actually kind of psychopathic as well, but... Hildebrand is definitely up there with like most like realistically flawed character, not which, just cartoon villain, you know? Which is whereas well, Garma's well, actually kind of fabulous. Like Garma's kind of like likable, whereas Hildebrand just is not. So would do you feel like as we're talking about roles, do you feel like this was an odd choice for Barrington? Yes. Considering but then I'm not sure what he would have played. Florian probably. I will say that I think Barrington. As I recall, Barrington did not sing Captain Corcoran so great. He was almost denied a part in Pirates before they wrote The Sergeant, which was almost oh, written yeah. comedically low as a joke. Yeah. Um, then Grosvenor, you know, famously had the chromaticism in the Act 1 finale, which was also a prank mm. on him. And on Terror Rat, we're going to get into shortly. Um, and then this, like, I don't think he really hits his stride until the Mikado, wherein mm. after Mikado, I think every Barrington role is a, is one of the best roles yes, ever. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and so yeah. I feel like King Hildebrand is like, is pre Mikado Barrington, where like Barrington mm. being the star that he was that could ad lib and pork pie and do all that kind of stuff. Like this is just before he's given that permission, I hypothesize. Um, but we're gonna get it's into- It's not the... a funny role at all. King is... Hildebrand is not in the least bit well, funny. Let's, this is the first Barrington role we've come up to. Wow, is it really? It is, yeah. So, so Incredible. we're gonna we're gonna get into that hard because he's our boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna say Barrington is the all time greatest originator of Gilbert and Sullivan parts. I love the, him. The best. I mean, I like Jesse Bond too, but yeah, Barrington. Jesse's number two. Jesse has a much better autobiography than Barrington does because hers is full of. Uh, revisionism in a way that's more revealing about the author than if she had told the truth. I've never read it. I should read oh, it. Oh, it's so good. Yes, um, well, yeah, I should read it. Okay, up next, 17 is Mr. Goldberry, which you had- Oh, finally. You had a 21 and I had a 13. And I could- But you I, know what? I'm pleased. I'm, I'm not I'm not at all, I, I'm very much like, I get why you put him high, because the thing is, his music is fantastic. And for some ungodly reason, I only gave him a 13. I think that was just an error. Mm. Because he, well, he, of course, oh, well, he deserves more than a thirteen. That's may, really may I, strange. May, right? I, may I tell yeah. you, I, I think that you're going to agree with me here. Both yeah. Hildebrand and Goldberry received a total of one hundred and five. I decided Goldberry probably edges out Hildebrand, even though yeah. it's like I, even though you ranked them, like you ranked Goldberry um, lower. Huh. I just feel it's like actually interesting because, like, when I I did these scores recently and I checked them, but. When I look at my Goldberry scores, they do seem very low. I wonder if I was just trying to be very, uh, I, I don't know. I think that uh, I, I felt I felt a little bit um, triggered recently by somebody trying to say that I have a bias towards Utopia Limited. This wasn't, you know, to do with the videos. It was just to do with the conversation I had. And so may maybe I made these scores just after I had that conversation Ooh, with the person. I'm because, so no, sorry. I need to be, I I'm need so to be. Can I talk Can I talk to that person for a second? Um, why do you insist on punching down? Why do you think that like going, oh, I think you're overrating Utopia. Like get a life. Oh, Isn't yeah, it yeah. a better world if all of the shows have fans? Yeah. Isn't it a better world if every role and every character has people who love it dearly? Yeah, so I definitely think Goldberry deserves probably about five more marks from me across the board. Well, if that's that, the, would that affect his placement? That would, but I'll, let's just say that it doesn't because we, we we got he's gonna. It's fine. Yeah. Um, I I think that See, I, I, think, oh, I think I've been consistent though, so I think I've also been quite yeah. harsh on other people. I maybe shouldn't have been. Well, harsh I think so I, I'm, I'm consistent. And I'm I think happy. we love his Act One finale. I gotta tell you, I yeah. oh I God. I spiced up that number even more this past 
solo oh. show. Oh, so really? Oh, I can't wait to see it. In, in the solo show that I, I did last year and this year, um, I include some seven men in the Act One finale with the guitar. And the uh, the abilities for that song to be a pop number is, I keep exploring them. And I, I found some, I was singing <laughs> new notes this time. If you come to greet the critters are craving for nothing that is planned by more than verses you have an opportunity to riff so i enjoy that very much obviously goldberry um can suffer a bit under a uh, poor stewardship by the um actor or director but i think mm. that played sweetly and, and nicely i think he's a real he's a real nice guy he's got a load of material he's got all that stuff in the act one finale he's got some dialogue he's got society is quite forsaken he's got um he, a solo slash duet depending on what well, people want he, to play at a wonderful is, joy. And he's got the quartet. It's great. He is the best flower of progress outside of the league. Oh, center. for sure. For sure. Right. Yeah. So he's the one you'd want to play if you were in a production and you yeah. were Captain Fitz. So um mm. let's 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 keep going for time. Um Yeah, next, but he's great and I love Goldberry. Up next is Mount Ararat from Iolanthe. You ranked wow. him 14, I ranked him 17. I'm just interested because there are still some of mine that are quite low that you've not talked about. So, yet, so this so. is this is another Barrington role and it's one I haven't played. I've only ever played the Lord Chancellor oh. in this in this, in this this opera. So I haven't had an opportunity to ever play anybody else. And um, I'd love to, I always feel like his parts are the trippiest. Um, we talked at length about his aria in the other video, so go see that. But um, I think I think that my issue with Mantara is also probably from my experience, which is there are a lot of people who love to play Mount Ararat, and there's something about me that doesn't get it. And this is me punching up, I think, where I'm like, <laughs> trying like i'm trying to get it i'm not saying mount tarot's overrated but there are a lot of people that are like oh I, mount tarot is like the best juiciest part and it's interesting because I, I, yeah i don't see it either that's but there, yeah. there are people that there are people that love roles these a lot of a lot of these roles like yeah it's their best friend and um he's got nice lines he's got good little singing bits um mm. but i do i do but, feel yeah, like yeah. We, we you you've spoken about this too that like he and Talal are our really chorus principles. And they're by they're not standing on their own quite so much. Perhaps they do suffer a little bit by comparison. And again, we don't have to talk about a solo again, which we both agree is on paper a uh, week. But um, he's a nice guy. He's a nice enough guy. But I think that he just, he's not sparking a huge fire within me for sure. But you tell me you I think have, I, I have rank. definitely been I have been spoilt. I mean, I didn't give him that he was very middle of the pack for me. But I I, I have been spoiled by the fact that my very first experience of Mount Ararat was when I played Phyllis. And the person playing Mount Ararat was Ben McAteer, who now sings for like ENO and et cetera. He did that it role for them. Ve- it is, yes. Mm-hmm. He's 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 now sung Montero for the like ENO, but he and he sang he sang King Paramount uh, recently with both Scottish Opera and the National Junior Opera Company. Um, but yeah, it's it's it, it was 
yeah, that was my first experience of a Mount Hara. We, we had a fantastic Talola as well. And so my first experience of those two parts was like, wow, these are the best. And I actually got the last bow, I seem to remember. Like Mount Hara and Talola got the last bow in that show. So like it was so my perception of those two parts right from the off was like these are really great meaty parts and then as I did Ayalanthi more and more myself like under my own steam I started to realize actually wait it was those guys that made those parts good not that people since haven't made them good but I just started to think a bit more intelligently about the material and I've realized that a lot of what is really loved about those parts are kind of things that just the it's it's because it's it gives opportunities to the actors, but the actual material itself it isn't as strong as compared to others. Like when Britain really ruled the waves, it's it's not it's not a strong aria compared to most of the others. And also the trio with Phyllis, you know, I'm very much pain to refuse, and perhaps I may incur your blame. You know, it's actually not very, he's he's actually got some of the weakest material in Iolanthe. And Iolanthe is sparkling, it's wonderful music, yet actually Mount Ara stuff, it really isn't the best in it. It's yeah, I, I think that um, if I auditioned for a production of Iolanthe, this wouldn't be the part I'd be going for. So yeah. maybe there's a bias there as, as a baritone, but I'd love to try, I mean, I'm at a point where I'd love to try any part I've never done. I have to do every mm. part as a Problem. Oh yeah, me too. Which is we have to. But then his line, he's got some fantastic lines though. That one, um, just after the nightmare song, where he says, "When we when we see you, my lord, we naturally say to ourselves, this is very sad," and then he starts talking about trilling on the bench and yeah, with Dante and six eight time, and it's he's got this wonderful speech, and him and Talala are so beautifully silly and stupid and. There's a, there's a lot to be said about these parts, but they just don't have much meat. There's not there's not much in their heads, so they're funny, but there's not really much else. Yeah, to those I th parts, I th and that's really. that's that's by design. But I think we can argue that. I mean, who can argue like that? Those roles stand up as an intellectual challenge next to the Lord Chancellor. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. Uh, let's move on to fifteen, which we've marked both around the same place, 15 for you, 16 for me, is the Prince of Monte Carlo himself. Yay, I'm glad he did really well. Like considering he's quite a small part, I'm glad he's done so well. And like, again, in the Grand Duke that I did a couple of weeks ago, the Prince and Princess of Monte Carlo, like completely stole the show. And you know what? I could admit when a show is, st is stolen from me and that's fine, that is fine. But like, yeah, they completely, just they they took that show That's and they, what you want. it was so funny and they they came they were both but it what but they weren't just saying the lines that it was like they had they were so relaxed like i've never seen a pair of people less nervous on stage and it was just th th people need to buy the dvd of that production purely for those two and the herald it was they 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 were such a great team and i think that when they came off of their curtain call at the end that was like always the loudest cheer because they left such an impression and that was considering that i was in the show so i'm just gonna let that sink in i was in the show well let's argue that the part you played which <laughs> in this production was lisa uh, I've played Ludwig. People have forgotten about me by the time the show's ended, but I'm I mean, trying to use no, that no, as a compliment no, but, no, but, to them because it was uh, but, so good. They but I'll so say good. for me as well as Ludwig, even though I'm on stage the whole the second act, yeah. the, that role exists in a way where you have to forfeit the stage to all the weird people who keep coming on. Yeah, exactly. And it is sort of wonderful, I feel like, when the Prince of Monte Carlo can come on and I'll be like, Oh, thank God. Like you have the ball now. Like, yeah. I don't like, like Ludwig is tired of holding the ball in act two. He's like, someone else just take this from me. Just, just take it. And so when but so, his lines are so good. Yeah. It would be a shame to cut, um, the numismatist because if you cut, I should like to collect a few coins myself, then his line about, I'd like, should like to collect a few wives isn't as funny. So again, I would just say, I can't imagine a production where they would cut that numismatist line, but if they yeah, did that- I can't that, imagine it either. Yeah, I don't th know. that would be, yeah. that'd be odd. But um, it's good. I mean, there's there's dynamite stuff. I think that David Jones was wonderful in this role. Oh my God. 
David Jones in this role. Or well, David Jones and Joanna. Like, just, yeah, they, they, they made such a good team as the prince and princess. May, I'm going to include some footage of his best bits right here. I am the father of the princess of Monte Carlo. <laughs> Doesn't that convey any idea to the Grand Ducal mind? Nothing definite. <laughs> it's Never mind, we will try again. <laughs> Alors. This is the daughter of the Prince of Monte Carlo. <laughs> Do you take? No, no, go on, don't give up, I dare say it will come presently. Speak up, no, we will try again. <laughs> Alors, 20 years ago, little doddle doddle, Two little doddle doddles, eh? happy father, hers and yours, proud mother, yours and hers. Ah, no, you take, I see you do, I see you do. Nothing is more annoying than to feel you're not equal to the intellectual pressure of the conversation. <laughs> Wasn't that good? I, I especially like the bit you included. Yeah, I, I like that bit as well. And he also has some that that um we're rigged out in a magnificent array. Also, one of my favourite musical moments, as you were saying, that like the ending is where it's actually quite similar to the end of the Herald song, which is maybe deliberate. Well, yes, I think it is um, because it has the same kind of chord progression, uh, the kind of vibes oh, you it. get of. Um, well, depending on the key you're in, but it's like I'm think that kind of thing which reminds me always of um oh, there's that kind of, there's a, uh, at the end of that uh that kind of fits into that category um so yeah. the prince the prince is a good guy he's got great notes uh i've done the prince in concert i'd love to do a production of the prince and you know what maybe i'll even be in the chorus of the first half just might so, you should do it. I mean, I hate the idea of showing up to a show and then sitting around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that, so speaking of that, let's talk about number 14, which is Louis. Finally, yeah, because he was quite low down. Not not that I do not like, I love well, Louis, but he was he was between Harold and Mr. Goldberry. For I saw, me. I saw, let's say he was 20 that. for you and 11 for yeah. me. You marked Louis lower than Matarat, the Prince, Florian, yeah. Dr. Tannhäuser. The Herald, Sir Richard Chumley, King Hildebrand. What for you do you think made it so that Louise was lower than some of these other guys? The size of the part, the fact that he doesn't really have much character as an individual. We know that he loves Casilda, and I think actually him and Casilda are the most fleshed out characters in the gondoliers, but all the gondoliers' characters do suffer from this problem and that they just seem to, they, they, my empathy doesn't stretch far enough that I really care about what happens to Lewis and Casilda because I I just don't really know them well enough. And um, I, I love, he's got some good music and he's got some funny lines and I, I, I really do like this character, but he has so little stage time. And it's just, and he, he, he just doesn't really, he is not really terribly present in the opera. But I would say though, that if he, so if, any of you have got my Gondolier's Heva DVD yet and have seen George Priestley in this role. Um, George Priestley was also, caught, and the same, same for Sam Snowden actually, who played this part in the summer. Um, they, they were both chorus while they weren't Louis. And actually the kind of chorus slash Louis track probably would be way higher. Do, do you know what I mean? Because actually that's so much fun. And and because like because like you get the joy of being in all of the most amazing music in the canon. Well, you know some of it. Do you know? I, but then he wants to get to play quite a characterful part. But it's it is just so small, you know. Do you know? I I didn't choose to do that. I don't. I feel like maybe I missed out. But um, yeah, I think because I, I I was too worried about Louise. Louise did stress me out because he is a baritone role. Just so you know. Uh, the same creator as Sir Richard Chumley. So just like keep that in mind. And when tenors play Louise, they tend to have too easy a time with the harmony and the harmonies never come out. And you can hear this. I know recordings are different than live performances in terms of acoustics, but mm. if you compare Jeffrey Skitch, do it for the Doily Carton 61. And then when they have like a second tenor in their role, 
in their later recording, um, there's a couple that are on compilations and the one in the, the late seventies, <clears throat> you barely hear those harmonies for Louise. Whereas you sort of do need, I mean, mm. Sam did such a wonderful job of bringing those harmonies out. I tried my best. Yeah. It is, it is high for me. So it is a higher baritone role than you usually see in GNS, but I think that is by design. And for like a grand opera baritone, this is nothing. This range of this is not high at all, but it must be lyric. And he does um, present some problems in that regard. Um, I did think that it was interesting. We had such a divide here because obviously my one time playing Louise was opposite you. And, and that was I, great. And I, but I'm here thinking, Rachel, did you not have a nice time? Of course, but, you, but I also don't rank Casilda that highly either. Ah, well, you discuss you, you, you. Do you know what? Do you know what, Rachel? You're unfair, unfair to the gondoliers. You overrate Utopia Limited, and you should be nicer to the gondoliers. That's a yeah, I, 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 I think that if we were saying, okay, if we're saying that Louis also gets to be in a chorus when he's not Louis, then his then his ranking immediately goes number up. one. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, you know, he's a good guy. <laughs> I'd love to do it again someday, but at this point. Um, he is my third favorite character I've played in the Gondoliers. So mm. that, I- But I, you've only, how many characters have you played in the Gondoliers? Three. So um, yeah, the patter guy and then somebody coming up next, I preferred. Yeah. But, but that's just because th that material is more gifty. But yeah, I had fun. Yeah. I had fun with you. I, I definitely love when we did our dialogue and anytime I forgot my line, I would just go, Casilda. 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 Because that's Casilda. Because that, that was funny. It's a little bit of incredulity as to whatever you had just said. Uh, but he's he's wonderful, and um, I'd love a crack at him not outdoors, where you like your voice just disappears. Mm. So uh, maybe we do a, a version in a church someday, and that'll please me. Let's that go to number. Be nice. Up next at number thirteen after Louise is Florian. Which oh. is from Princess Ida, starring Florian. And Florian, I love. I would love to do Florian in a production, and I would love to make him nice. He should, he's meant to be nice. In the Tennyson poem, he's so wholesome. He's like the sweetest guy, along with Hilarion. Like, and those two are like described as being like so close and they're really affectionate with each other. They're like properly like good examples of like guys who are just really sweet and like gentle with each other. Um, and it's just, they're so nice. Apart, there's, there's own, the only thing I don't like about the Florian character in the Tennyson is the way he talks about Melissa as, oh, I just, I love how kind of like pure she looks. And I I, I think, but the thing is it was written in 1849. So I guess that- if Very easy fix, valued. very yeah. easy fix. Have him say that, but have his eyebrows say that she's not pure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just to say yeah. like, I'm, cause she even says in, in the Gilbert anyway, that like, mm -hmm that the men's faces are are rough and they're they're she's tired of women's faces melissa is canonically bisexual don't you agree because I, she she admits right. she admits when she touches the florian's face that she that has she, touched a woman's face yeah yeah, yeah. and like it's very yeah, cool that like nice. the girls are with like their girls because of this experiment and they hang out and they have fun Melissa, canonical bisexual, it's true. And so is Sir Joseph. Mm. And so with all that being said, um, I think that she's she's been around, she has some experience and Florian could be into that. He could be like, oh, she's not pure. Or just change the line, say that she's um, schooled. Mm. Anyway. Anyway. Florian has- But yeah, his scenes with Melissa are so good. I he, love the scenes of Melissa. So. Yeah, that little baby scene is so funny. You talked about in your in your video um, between the two of them. I think Florian um, has the the benefit of wonderful harmony parts, and he's got something that's really special to me, which is he sometimes has harmonies that aren't the bass line, though he's on the bottom. Uh, but Ooh. his 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 harmony Ooh. in 
Broken Toy, which you know I ranked number one in our quartets, and it ranked, I think, very high up overall. Yeah. Um, I, God, I could sing. Florian is a role I could do. If this is a role that, yeah, I'd love to do in a production. But if anybody's ever like, we're doing a concert of Princess Ida tomorrow night, you can pick any role. I will always pick Florian. Oh, okay. Because my other choices are actually just like Hildebrand, Arak, and Gama. Mm. And I'd kind of rather sing harmony all night. I often judge my my preference for a role being how much harmony do I get to sing? Mm. And I find that some of these roles that are like mostly solo only are a little less fun. So Florian mm. does have that benefit. A lot of these middle roles have a lot of great harmony. And um, though I wish he was a bigger part, I also do appreciate that he opens the show. Mm. Yes, he does. Yeah. Though, it, th though that didn't have to be him. It's nice that he gets to sing the music, but it's not, we, we don't really remember his character from that. Like we don't get who he is from that. You can if you stage it in such a way that he's leading the chorus's interest in the panorama, because then in the dialogue, he's the one who's looking in the eyeglass. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So like yeah. you could you could stage it like, I mean, he's usually seen like as the guy doing this at the st start of the show the mm -hmm. chorus is singing this idea mm -hmm. right so then he kind of picks that up but that's i know i'm you're building a lot in there but um i do love we were talking about um this dialogue and i do love his dialogue in that first scene um and i think that for him to be a little deadpan again always always helps things a bit um the only change I make to him textually is I give him some of Hilarion's material in the Act Three dialogue. Well, I, I Florian insults Gamma <laughs> instead of Hilarion, and I give yeah, because that that really rubbed me up the wrong way in the dialogue. I hated the fact that Hilarion was rising to Gamma's insults, and to me that completely undervalued Hilarion as a character. And yeah. I think that was a massive mistake on Gilbert's part. And I don't know what he was thinking. Flor Be have, yeah, because I love Hilarion until that moment. If Florian, it's really if, sad. If, if Florian says it, then it gives Hilarion an opportunity to be like, do not insult my future mm, father in law Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as much as we disagree yeah. with him. And Florian also takes in my um, preferred edit, one of the verses of Wisest Wit. Because Hilarion yes. should, at that point, shouldn't be it's, celebrating it's yeah, anti-Ida yeah. anti sentiment. So mm -hmm. uh, do, do you feel like he's in a good rank, though, 13? Yes. That was about where I put him. I think I put him as 13, didn't I? Did indeed. I had him as yeah, 13. Yeah, so, so that's perfect for me. Let's do number 12. Which yeah. is Dr. Tannhäuser. Ah. He was 11 yeah. for you. Yeah, so roughly... We just missed that a couple because but now we now we've done my bottom block and but now we've got a gap of two. Does a Tannhäuser? Oh, his music! He gets to be in. Um, I mean, no spoilers for next week, but he gets to be in two pretty good quintets, and he has a great solo with like quintet, you know, additions. Oh, quintets are next week, huh? Yeah, I've already done it. You've already done it? Oh my gosh, no spoilers, yeah. please. Yeah, I'm, um, keep going. I'm doing something. And, 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 okay. Th this is big. This is a big thing that he gets to do. He gets to sing the forbear, forbears. Because the theatre company, Forbear Theatre, was named after those forbear, forbear, forbear. He was he uh, the company was named after those forebears, and he gets to sing them. So that that's, that's good. But yeah, but it's I I I think that the reason he's not hired because I absolutely love his music is yeah he doesn't have much presence in Act Two and also he doesn't really have any kind of emotional stakes in what's going on. And let, well, but I mean, he is a lawyer for the. The thing is, he should have emotional stakes, but then he seems really laid back about it. Wait, did you say he was a lawyer or did you say he was a Papanax? Um, Rachel, I love Dr. Yes. Tannhäuser. I, I got to play him in concert once and I love singing He's his great. harmonies. His harmonies are really nice. He does have that crossing harmony with Ernest, which reminded me that 
Um, this was a role originated by Scott Russell, who originated the role of Lord Dromley, and whose other roles with the Doily Cart included. <clears throat> Excuse, please. His other roles with the Doily Cart included Cyril and Princess Ida, but also Mr. Goldberry in the touring company. And he sang Leonard Merrill, and he sang a tenor role and some other thing. He sang the Duke of Dunstable, <laughs> Frederick, Talaller, Cyril, Nanky Poo, Colonel Fairfax, and Marco, and Rafe Rackstraw. I think he might, I think, he, I think again, this, this is a case where we go like, I love this role as a baritone. I had a baritone play this role in 2016. We had a baritone play him in 2018. It's not that high. And if you have a baritone, that little up, up going up to like G moment in the that in Strange the Views is not undoable. Like none of this is outside of the realm of possibility. Um, I'm always a person that like if a role could be either if it's in the middle, I always prefer a baritone. But sometimes you need more tenors in your show. Um, I would say though that like if you were to cast somebody who doesn't think Princess Ida uh, is sexist that would be a mistake i think that casting somebody in the part who like goes about going uh don't get mad at princess ida that would be a real problem mm -hmm. definitely if that person was a tenor they shouldn't be given a patter roll a baritone patter roll at any point yeah that would, be, that would be so so misguided but uh otherwise i would say that dr tonhoiser is a hit and i think that I play, love him. played by the two guys we had in our productions, the Utopia Opera and the Forbear productions, which I think were superlative Dr. Tannhäuser's, um, then I think that this is a role that is very underrated. Absolutely, and because it, 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 especially when he gets to be present in Act Two as himself, just kind of there singing the chorus stuff as well, because then you get to sing that lovely chorus music. Because I remember, like, it, it didn't really make much sense for Lisa to be on for a lot of the Act 2 numbers, but I was like, no, I want to be on. I want to sing in all the chorus numbers because I was, I'd i never really sung. Your Highness has a party at the door. I'd never sung that song when I got to do that. But, like, yeah, so if you are, if you get to sing all that incredible harmony stuff in the opening, and you've got some funny lines, too, like, surely I'm not late. You know, there's just, there's just things you can, there's just, there's ways you can play that character. You got a uh, lot of scope as an actor, you know. Classic, to, to classic moment, classic, classic direction moment, which uh, I did, and then you did. It wasn't a coincidence, by the way, but it was just in, in that order. Was having Doctor Tannhäuser speak to Julia in a German accent when he thinks she doesn't understand it, like "Dear, dear, the ignorance <laughs> of the laity." My good girl, it is the glorious maxim of maxim. our constant. It's, it's so good. Um, and it makes complete sense within the world of what's happening. That like, he's like, you do yeah. not, I, like, I will explain this to you in your voice. So yeah. uh, he's a hit. And um, yeah, more baritones and fewer tenors in this role, please. And then, uh, of course, so, so David Jones played both the notary and the Prince of Monte Carlo. And he was also an excellent notary that's a it was, brilliant cause, double cause it was because he was just so he was just so easy as the notary it was just like because oh, everyone else is properly high stakes really really panicked and he's just he, and he's just very condescending and it's it's it's, it's great we love he was, that he was a, that we was, love he was, a, he was a and we love drape person. draping wreaths of bay and ivy on him in his suit oh yeah and because he wore his she what he wore his sheet over his um suit that mm -hmm. was cute so now let's go to number 11 which is we ra both ranked 12 which is the council for the plaintiff. interesting a role we both played the council for yes. the plaintiff um which is my favorite part in trial by jury i love the usher He's great. I guess to play, <laughs> having having played in concert at least all of the male roles in Trial by Jury, and I've done productions yeah. of the Council and the Foreman. Um, Council to me is like such a dynamite sing. Mm. 
and he has oh he's so good he doesn't come in until quite late well but, so, like, apart so, from so, that, he, he's great. so i i thought of it this way when i did it not long ago i did it a few weeks ago and i was thinking that like yeah the usher opens it well but then the council gets to play cleanup and mm. in doing so has the more lasting impression yeah so because the usher is more for, more uh, in the mix at the beginning the council kind of takes his spot once the trial gets going mm -hmm, and mm. you, you really do feel like like you get the show handed to you at the midway mark and honestly like the fact that you you come in you see first thing you say is swear thou the jury which i don't know why that's the council's job someone explain that yeah to you. and then he goes where is the plaintiff let her now be brought then he sits down again and then he's just been biding his time so much so that may it please you my lad gentlemen of the like i am so ready now i've charged up all of my uh acuity and i'm ready to torch this trial and that is to me a gift that like you've been though you haven't been doing that much oh you did sing they will well and truly try which yeah it's, the this the the usher, the judge, the counsel, and the defendant. Mm -hmm. I've seen many productions where one or more of those singers don't know they sing that. Mm -hmm. I've seen it happen. Be careful. Good moment. So, uh, and then of course you get, you know, great lines like, but I submit my blood with all submission. Which is that's so, good. That's but I so just, I absolutely just love the opening that, uh, with a sense of deep emotion, I approach this painful case, for I never had a notion that a man could be so base. I just love that poetry. Yeah. And I, I, lo I love how normal that language is. It's like, that is just, it's kind of what people would say in a court, but it's also so stupid. It's just, it's so emotional and yet so calm and flat. It's, I can't really quite describe it. This is something really perfect about Trial by Jury. And as you say, that the council is a really strong part in it. And great music. I get it 16 that, for music. That solo for me is the highlight of the show. And Nice oh, Dilemma. Oh, I love it. Which he gets a great line in Nice Dilemma. Yes. So... <laughs> Oh. Yeah, wonderful. Um, definitely, again, testing the range of, um, I guess I could see who created this part. I know the Shermer score says tenor at the front of the book, but it's definitely one of those parts where, I mean, you've, you've have experience of it playing it as a soprano. Yeah, but it was low. It, but, but, yeah. you, but you did the solos up an octave? Yes, but it was low for me. And, and when it came to the harmony, like Nice Dilemma, did you sing that on pitch? I think I think I did, yes. Mm. That's hard. Yeah. But the thing is for me, because it was like recorded in different chunks, it didn't matter that I had to kind of start each session in a different vocal place, like it was fine. I understand. And I could also just sing it like directly into the microphone. So it was quite easy to sing low. Because I actually have quite a low, I have a very low set speaking voice. And so to me, actually, like singing baritone is actually fine. I just can't really project baritone. But I can reach pretty much all the notes. I understand. Um, I I could find nothing about the person who created this role. Besides the fact Interesting. that, that he did really? this Yeah, I think that it's definitely, I mean, I will tell you, I discovered something about it. Oh, you always do. Every time I do any GNS show, I discovered that I had actually, for all of my side eyes at the camera, for people who've missed certain hard to miss, uh, easy to miss details, I missed in um, the end of the show, it goes, uh, yes, no, I'm a judge and a good judge too, yeah, or, or uh, for whatever he says. Um, and the first time, the council sings, yeah. And a good judge too. And a good judge too. Judge too. Right there. Then the second time, because the defendant is singing, no, 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 no. He doesn't sing, and a great snob too, which means the defendant 
doesn't sing the F sharp. He just comes in on the G. He goes, the defendant is a snob. No, no, no. The defendant is a snob. No, no, no. Sullivan changes the council's line so that he takes that F sharp, but then goes down. So the first time was then for great snob two, it's so that you borrow I remember like yeah I remember having a whole conversation with Marisa who was then doing that I had a whole conversation I was like is this really right I couldn't but but that's why there's Sullivan always has a reason there's always a reason there are things like like the the trio the trio parts in um if you go in are different than the ones in the act two finale of Iolanthe, you have mm-hmm. to like look really carefully sometimes yeah. and see, ah, because the orchestration has changed or because there's another, someone else is singing a new note. So yeah, because the defendant drops out of that one note, you can now have <laughs> as in all the harmony. So mm-hmm. the more you know, hey, let's get into the top 10. Yay, top 10. So what's cool about Wait, the top- is it top 10? Isn't it top 10? Oh no, it is top 10. I can't. Count. Our top 10s are the same but not in the same order, right? So we have the same exact top 10. That's so cool. Which I mean, that shows you, you know, that we've got a unanimous opinion. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that there might be a couple here that surprised us, but again, I don't, okay. there's not a single part here that I don't think is a masterpiece. And to say that, I mean, again, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, all but all but two of these are Barrington roles. So now we're at like the it's inter- I think it really has proven that like the ones that are actual Barrington roles are our favorites. Um It's just it's I think I know the two, but I'm going to wait until you say them when we Well, talk so about them. so number 10 is one of the ones that isn't. Yeah, that's and, what I thought. <laughs> and it is um it is what so, I think. And so I'll describe it because we're going to describe it a certain way. Um first of all, the word I've been using is, is auxiliary, auxiliary, but I, auxiliary, only, yeah. I only learned recently that there are two eyes in that word. I've been saying auxiliary, but oh, it's actually, that's, yeah. it's auxiliary, isn't it? Auxiliary, yeah. I did not auxiliary. know that. So I came up with this term back when I was like, in, when I was like 18 because I was noticing listening to the stereo set of GNS recordings uh, insofar as they've been reissued, wherein they don't use the Peter Pratt fifties ones for Pirates and Mikado, but they mm. use the, the later ones from 68 and 73 with John Reed. And that set, which is like a very well circulated one, uh, I was noticing like, okay, well, John Reed's always here. And then Kenneth Sanford's always here. And then mm-hmm. Do- Donald Adams and, um, John Eldon are always here. And, but then there's always like another baritone. And I didn't know who, who he was. And truly some of these get a little funny because like I more described this to describe not the roles, but the rep company atmosphere. So if we put it this way, in the Dorley cart, you had Ken Sanford or whoever was playing his track uh, at various eras. But he has the long uh, such a he had such a long tenure with the cart in that last few decades that he's basically their Barrington in a lot of people's minds. Mm. Because he also like just ran the gamut. Ironically, he gave up the sergeant of police very early on, and he never played a role in Pinafore. So he wasn't in two of the big three, um, which is amazing to me that he was <laughs> so loved as he as he was. So I was noticing a couple of people who showed up a lot and I was like, what were they to the cart? And these are singers like Jeffrey Skitch and Alan Styler and slightly later Michael Rayner. And they tended to like pick up whatever John, Don and Ken didn't do. So in the case of the, the role we're about to talk about, the auxiliary baritone in the Mikado, who sings our great Mikado, and among other things, um, this role would be like it's Michael Rayner on the '73 recording, and this this track is often very interesting to me. Some other roles that have been in this track, and uh, we've talked about already, Florian 
uh, played by Jeffrey Skitch. Uh, Louise also was played by Jeffrey Skitch in, in that set of recordings. Um, you could argue the Prince of Monte Carlo could be kind of in there, but it sort of depends. Um, mm. Goldberry was a Michael Rayner role on that recording. But again, I think with Utopia and Duke, we, maybe these tracks are like even more fuzzy because they didn't have the originators in them as often. Uh, Major Murgatroyd is absolutely in this category. Um, then um, you could even count things like um, pretty much like any of these. But um, it was more interesting to me because um, when you got in, when you got into the nitty gritty of it, um, Captain Corcoran and Giuseppe were played by in those recordings Jeffrey Skitch and Alan Styler respectively. Oh, because, yeah, because Ken Sanford wasn't around. Because yeah. Ken Sanford um, yeah. just wasn't in Pinafore, yeah. and then Ken Sanford played W. H. Denny's role of Don Al in Gondoliers. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, and yeah. not the Barrington role of Giuseppe. Mm. So. A little confusing there. But anyway, I just want to give a shout out to Alan Styler. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I regret. Alan Styler plays Dr. Daly on the 60s recording of Sorcerer. Ken Sanford did play Dr. Daly and played him a lot. And I mm -hmm. can't recall exactly why he's not on that recording. But um, so I always, always, always fascinated by those, those guys who always play these supporting baritone roles and often play them very well. Mm -hmm. And I just want to give everybody who's played like who's been that guy in the company or our company a bit of a show. I know I keep going on about this this film, but who who played him in the 1966 one with John Alden oh, as the McCoy? Oh, that, that is, that's the same, that's Thomas Lawler. He was and, so good. Yeah, Thomas Lawler, um, who goes on to be a bass, plays bouncer on the Brent Walker Coxed Box. And then goes on to play oh, okay. to play cool. to play bass roles with New Sadler's Wells as well. So mm -hmm. uh, Tom Lawler, yeah, he's wonderful in that. And uh, I I love I love this part so much. And I, I will say that I actually I, ranked it a bit higher than you did. Just a bit. I mean, it's I um I'll say Mark Richardson, I believe, who plays him in the ENO '80s recording, uh, okay. has one of my favorite line deliveries in in all of GNS that I've been. I've played this role. I played it with the Blue Hill Troupe, and I really yeah. do love this role. I've always said that I think this role has the best singing out of the three baritones in the in the Mikado. Ooh, okay, yeah. Mainly because our great Mikado is just the best. Oh, so good. He's reading the newspaper, and Eric Idle, as the patter guy, goes, um, and the city will be reduced to the rank of a village. And um, the auxiliary man says, but that will involve a soul and irretrievable ruin. He's clearly read the letter already. He clearly knows what it means. And he and the baritone have come in going, and this means that the patter guy is gonna have to decide to execute himself. Like they have, they I know the, the entire scene before it happens. So the whole time they're giving him like blowback, they're like, I don't know, I think you gotta do it. And- isn't, Wait, isn't, isn't he the one that says the line, I mean, even if you succeeded in cutting it half off, that would be something. Oh my God, yeah. Um, I don't think I want to put, put in a, an edit of this, but when I was in a senior year of high school, I did a video as all, all three guys where I did the dialogue scene. And, oh, wow, nice. And the dialogue scene, like, for this character, he was very American. He was very, like, chipper. And he's he's got such a good attitude. Also, he's got lines... I, I love that. I love it when he's just this, like, really wholesome, happy guy who's just, like, along for the ride. It's, it's great. And, I, and... I love it. And the salaries it. attached to them, you did. Yeah. Uh, and he's also, he also is um, a narc because at the end of the show, he's the one that's mm. like, your majesty, all is prepared. <laughs> like he's the one who comes it into is, the book and it's yeah. just like, I do, I hate all of these people. <laughs> so uh, we love him. He's a good, he's a good but guy. But it's like, the, there is, there is a part, there is a part of me that kind of slightly ships him and the other baritone together. There's just because uh, they're kind of often seen together and they just yeah, seem to have um, this like chemistry, you that's, know. That's how, that's how, that's how Gary directed it. I was filing my nails when the baritone says uh, to me or says, um, did I not unhesitatingly accept all their posts at once? And the salaries attached to them, you did. Like, yeah, it's just like, like a really, Fun, little like saucy. little kind of, yeah, it. it's a cute yeah. relationship. I like it. So, so this yeah. role, this role, I mean, I think we would I say is 
musically i gave an 18 this was high yeah up. me too big, I gave an big marks for music and a 17 for lyrics and dialogue i incredible he, his lyrics and dialogue are so so funny and he, and, and the thing is, he isn't even like his emotional stakes aren't even that high. I mean, I only gave him like a 13 for emotional slash dramatic impact. That's where his score falls down. But honestly, everywhere else. Well, wait, what did I, I, I gave him a I only gave him a five for presence and narrative because even though he's like there a lot. And he 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 isn't really part of the story like in Correct. any way that's okay <laughs> well but, but it's fine it doesn't actually matter he's still great and I, so I, love I will say that i love playing this part and i love people coming up to me and saying oh you're my favorite part in the show and he has oh. that ability but yeah i gave him a nine for enjoyment when oh. i was very young i was in a youth not youth production uh, a production for children of the mikado mm wherein the baritone oh. and, and this character were conflated into one role. Meaning, I Am So Proud was a duet, which oh. garbage. Oh. But, but it meant, and, and there was actually no Our Great Mikado, which is weird. But um, it was it was like a 90 minute version. It was very cut. Okay. But it meant that like I had like um, uh, certain times where I'd respond to myself in the dialogue. But I will say that, like, the show didn't feel like it was missing a, a guy. Mm. You still felt like emotionally the kids were like, oh, there was enough guys. Yeah, and, I got it. And they, the kids uh, then told me that I was their favorite. So, you know, that's all fine. That's nice. all fine. That's what you want, really. I, I am not a ham, <laughs> but when I'm playing to an audience of children, I absolutely, yeah. I'm like, I need, I need yeah. to be, I need to be their favorite. I gotta do There's it. There's actually, um, I've actually got quite a good story from um, my, the Shakespeare company that I work for. And this wasn't actually my tour, but there was a tour of Hamlet, which, you know, as you all know, isn't a terribly happy show. There's like lots of kind of unaliving in it. It's like very dark. Um, and there's not too many kind of funny moments for kids, but like they found themselves doing this show that was purely for like four and five year olds. And they were like, what are we going to do? Because they obviously hadn't, the teachers obviously hadn't realized like what kind of show it was. So what they did was they just hammed everything up. So like, the guy playing Claudius was like, Mwah! and they just, they just turned it into like a panto. And the, the kids loved it. I'm like, Hamlet should always be like that. So I think that the way to fix that, <laughs> anyway, I think, yeah. I think, I think, I think so that good. the way to fix Hamlet is to let Ham. <laughs> I saw Shakespeare in the Park last night. I saw Hamlet actually last night. Shakespeare oh my God! Park. How was it? It was oh, nice. I really enjoyed it. They played it. They played it with a lot of cuts. Very loose. Very hmm. quick without rushing the dialogue. A lot of really strong performances. Hmm. Polonius walked away with all of it until he died. Walked away with the show until he died. The whole first half. Wow. Was Polonius. Polonius show. and I honestly, Polonius is so funny. Like, so funny. and that's why him dying is so shocking because it's like he, he is hilarious like his lines are laugh out loud i'll tell you i'll tell you it was one of those moments so they took a the act break was right after hamlet doesn't kill claudius when he's praying that was where the act break was oh okay because like usually usually because like we did it just after after kind of claudius says light give me some light and goes out of the play i think that's it yeah, it's yeah, up right yeah, after yeah, that. Yeah. Um, oh, and, and I felt like yeah, that similar. that meant that Polonius just came right in and died. <laughs> like that, yeah. I yeah. yeah, I feel like I feel like there should be no inter inter intervals in Shakespeare, no intervals at all. There keep, shouldn't be. Just keep there actually, it going, really. Because then you're like, you but know the thing is, on. people need to pee, so that's, that's they do. Why, um, yeah. Did you sing a lot as Ophelia? Yeah. Yeah, they, they, this, the, 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 there was a lot of music in this production that was like modern pop, yeah, yeah. pop and uh, rap, rap styles. And so her singing was a little pop oriented. Oh, I loved it. I still it was, remember. How should I your true love know from another man? It was oh, so like folky that's really, and awesome. That's really nice. I I Hamlet's, it. Hamlet's really good. Um, speaking of really good, number nine is Captain Corcoran. <laughs> Yay! We both had him, I think, maybe lower than your average person would guess. I put, I put him number nine, and you can put him. So we both I, had him number nine. I had him as eight, yeah. And because um, you haven't discussed my number ten yet, but like, correct. Yeah, I, I I do like Captain Corcoran, but I can see why, and he deserves to be in the top ten for sure. 
but I can see why he's maybe not done like super well. I think that um, if I look at his scores for me, that might help. Music 17, lyrics 16, emotional dramatic impact 19, presence and narrative a 10. Um, this is the one that if all goes to plan, I'm playing for us this summer. And I'm terrified. Yeah. I've never played Captain Corcoran and it's a hard part, high roll. Um, yeah, it's a difficult song, that aria as we discussed. So I'm, I think that this is a role that I am hoping I leave the summer going. I wish I had put it way higher. And I think that um, it's telling that the top, my top, like so, such and such points, like all went to roles I've done. So we're Ooh. still at that point where like, I really wish I could do this one. Um, well, like, when, when I, do you remember when I was in New York and we were discussing all the Pata roles? And when we were discussing both Jack Point and the Pata guy and the Mikado, what makes them so, what makes those parts so good? is their constant anxiety that they're going to lose everything. Like for the Mikado guy, it's like his life. For Jack Point, it's Elsie, you know, and like for both of them, that they're equivalent because for Jack Point, like it may as well be his life. But like the captain is actually a similar kind of role. Like everything he does through the show should be like tainted with this with this extreme anxiety. And also he has this added addition of, he knows, like he doesn't know exactly what's wrong, but he knows he's in the wrong place. Like something doesn't feel right about him. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't, his his body is wrong. His like space around him is wrong. He does not feel secure in his position because he's not actually bred to be a captain because that's the kind of universe they're living in. So basically whenever anyone looks up to him, he doesn't know what to do with it. And whenever anyone disrespects him, he gets so defensive because he feels so insecure in his position. And I think if you approach it with that level of anxiety, immediately the part becomes, whoa, that's way more interesting. Absolutely. And we almost did yeah. it, Utopia Opera almost did it a couple weeks ago, but we didn't have the time to put it together. It'll happen in the fall, I think. And talking with someone who was gonna play the part, discussing the fact that really, that's why he swears, like he is, and that's yeah. why Rafe Rackstraw speaks so eloquently. And the two of them should feel like they are swapped from the beginning, mm -hmm. as opposed to the thing that I think is a little naff when Captain Corcoran comes out and he's like, it is odd, is it not, my dear? Where like, he's suddenly a different guy. Whereas yeah. like, he's just in yeah. a different costume and he's like, I I know this is hard, but like, I should be in this costume. And um, I remember this is this fella who I was talking to who's, who's played Captain Corcoran probably more times than any human being alive. Do you know what's just occurred to me? Yeah. I have to find another captain costume for Rafe at the end. Oh. That sucks. Anyway, yeah, carry on. I did think about that myself and that seemed annoying. So maybe just switch their hats. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> they come on, they come on at the same time and nothing has changed. And everyone's like, and then Buttercup takes their hats and slowly switches them and backs away and everyone goes, oh! <laughs> I think that'll That's work. Good. Okay, like so that. um talking with this fellow who's played Captain Corcoran more than anybody alive and, and has ways that he wants to do it that he's not been able to do it because some people don't get it. A lot of people he said people would come up to him and say, I feel so bad for you at the end of the play because you don't get you you not the captain anymore. And he's like, But I get buttercup and I get to live the life I want. And he he was like, Yeah, the captain shouldn't want to be the captain. Yeah, and, and if, he, and if like, he, he's he's happiest when I think because I think he he thinks he wants to hold on to all this stuff, but then once it's gone, he's like, he's relieved. Oh, oh, okay, no, that's uh, this is this is good. Yeah, yeah. so I, I think, and that... then Sir Jay says, "Congratulations to you both." <sighs> Drama. This is everything I got into when I was like when I was directing it a few years ago. These are all things I noticed. I'm like. Wow, this is so much cleverer than we thought it was. So do you know what's so gonna good. be you know, it's gonna be good is you'll have a cast that that listens to you. Um so <laughs> let, let's <laughs> let's um let's move on. Um so in uh eighth place is Dr. Daly, who you ranked you ranked number 10, I ranked number six. Did I it's it's just because I, I do I do like his two arias and I think his dialogue's fantastic but 
you know, I, I do think he is slightly less present than some of these ones we haven't talked about yeah, yet. So I, I think... do think he deserves this spot. But he is lovely, and I it's... think he's such a charming, sweet character. Okay, do you yeah. have you have you ever heard of Cake? Do you know Cake? As in, like the food you eat? Yeah. What? Do you, you like you know about it? Like I don't know. Yeah, okay. I know about Cake. Yeah. Yeah. So do you know how sometimes Cake, like ice cream Cake, has like the cookie crumble layer? It's like a light. I have never in my life eaten an ice cream cake. Well, you've heard of cake. So, <laughs> like, ice cream cakes have like layers. They'll have like a frosting and then okay. like a cake layer and then like a uh, cookie okay. layer. Yeah, I yeah, love yeah. the cookie layer. I love that crunch in the middle and it's still chocolatey. It's nice. To me, Dr. Daly is that in the sorcerer. Okay. And like, without him, like, I think the texture of the show is wrong. And I think oh, he's, he's so very in much needed in so this integral. Yeah. I gave him a 20 for music. And I think that's because I Oh wow. That's I, I only gave him a 14. I oh, recently that, that got, was just compared to the others. But that's okay. Yeah. I recently got the chance to sing him again. Yeah. After the I, I I've never played the role, but I've sung it now two times a decade and two uh, twelve years apart from each other. Mm -mm. And I think it's like as good a sing as you can get in GNS. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it feels so, she has got so much wonderful music. He is the best, the best line in Marvelous Illusion. Musically, oh, does the, he? the best. Because he's got, oh, Marvelous Illusion. Right? So he's got that big line, and then it becomes, Marvelous Illusion. Oh, Marvelous Illusion. It's a really, really beautiful line. Uh, and he sings tenor with all that. It's, it's Sullivan's always like, you're the tenor, Barrington. You're the tenor. So that's great. Um, you get to enjoy like popping out high notes. Uh, but yeah, presence in narrative. I can see that it's less. I do feel like um, it's very hard to think about like him driving the plot. But then we talked mm. about time was and saying like, does time was, I gave that a higher plot score than you did when we did the yeah. arias and it was because I'm like, well, the establishment of him as a character is important, but then is yes. his character important? It can be. I do think that this is a part that people can leave the show thinking was their favorite guy. And I will like say that- Sorcerer is like more of an opera in that it's more of, it's kind of more, is it more about the scenes than the characters? Yeah, like the characters are important, but it's it's a much gentler narrative. Like the narrative is much simpler. Oh my God, and I, so, and I love yeah. it. I gotta tell you, I love yeah. that first 30 minutes of The Sorcerer. Oh, it's just, Alexa, it's just like, Alexis character, is like introduction, introduction, introduction. Yeah. At some point, Alexis is like, have you ever heard of John Wellington Wells? And the audience is like, oh, oh yeah. That's like, that, that's The Sorcerer, isn't it? Um, but the, everything before that is so, is so just chill. Everyone's just hanging out, explaining who they are. You've got wonderful dialogue scenes. It's all a hit. Sorcerer, mm. what a great show. Um, I love the Sorcerer. I think that, and and I'm glad Dr. D gets some love. Dan stole my fizzy orange. Well, it was our fizzy orange. So that Dan, was really sad. Dan, so I had to drink water instead. Stupid water, stupid life-giving water. Oh, hang, hang on. Can, can you, <laughs> <laughs> life-giving. Can you do that again? I want to do sound effect. Um, stupid life-giving water. Glug, 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 Wilfred, I don't know. I think this was a case where I'm like, my scores hmm. did Wilfred dirty somehow. But I think that's, again, a size of the role issue. Uh, maybe it's a, I've never played him, but I did get to do him in concert recently. And I was like, oh my gosh. The thing the thing is, in concert, like... No dialogue. He doesn't have like as much music, but his dialogue is so good. So good. Um, <laughs> so, but I give him a nine for enjoyment even then, and his lyrics. Oh, yeah, me too. I think I, I mean, listen, nine, yeah. listen yeah. Th this is my scores yeah. are 17, 19, 18. Like, the only time he's got a slightly lower score is presence and narrative is seven for me. But the point is, yeah, me too. These, these scores are now all so high that it's like these are such small differences between the scores. 
So the thing is, uh, what what amazes me about Wilfred is because uh, I understand that he was written as a brute. I, I understand that is what he is, you know, meant to be. But the thing is, the actual line suggests something more than that. And what's very interesting is how, it, it, like, people can make the very valid choice, which is what I sometimes do, of actually making him a bit more kind of down on himself and, like, not very brutish and just a bit whiny instead and actually very sweet and wholesome. And and it's interesting how people say, oh, he's meant to be a brute. He's meant to be horrible. Oh, Wilfred is this horrible, unpleasant character. I'm like... Have you read the words? Like, just read the words. He's actually, he's very sweet and polite. Do you know, I, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I talk to everybody for a second? Yeah. None of it is meant to be anything. At this point, tradition is so far removed from any possible authorial intent that it's very hard to say that there's any direct link back to what it should be. And mm. when I see comments on Facebook, like, oh, I wish this had the such and such costumes, the traditional, like, I, I want you to consider that every production of the show you see doesn't need to play and look exactly the same. And that it might be more interesting to go to productions that perhaps you dislike but are interesting. And I will tell you, I have always have a better time being surprised by something I don't like than being in the middle about something that is the way it's meant to be done. And I'd rather- yeah, I remember that I, I, I saw a production of um, Edward II, who is my favorite king, and it's a Marlowe play. I saw that at the National recently. And the thing is, they, they'd made this decision where like Edward's lover Gaveston was like abusing him, and that is so far from the text and like so far from historical accuracy. But you know what? I was like, ooh, it's valid because what they've done is still. I say it was far from the text. It, you know, it was still consistent with the text. It was just like a liberty. But I'm like, yeah, that that adds a different dynamic to Edward's character. Yeah, try it, do it, just try stuff. Like try stuff. You, you, like what what yeah, like whatever you want to do with these characters, like try it out, you know? Like if you don't oh I prefer it when so and so is and this. Yeah, it's totally okay to have uh, so I, I will but say... also just like yeah, tr try try something. And even if even if you don't like something, just appreciate how that changed the show. Like, huh. I, okay, it's it's like how one time I saw Jack Point played as like a drunkard. I was like, you know what? The reason I didn't like Jack Point played that way is because I lost sympathy for him, and I felt like that didn't add anything to the show. It took something away. So if so, just so don't just say, oh, I like you this. Know, you know, I, I, like... I think I think we we have a certain privilege, which is that we are both directors <laughs> and actors. Yeah, 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 and with which means that we do find value 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 in seeing something that we don't necessarily like because then when we do we we understand more about the text and our feelings on it mm. whereas i think there are people that want to go spend the money and see what they've seen this is why the doily card existed and if ever if everybody who's watching this goes and watches the 1982 clip where the doily card is it on omnibus was the show doily card appears and does a little bit of pinafore as they talk about losing their council funding. Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to tell you, some of the things said by members of the cart in that video are a little iffy in terms of mm. their perspective on what was happening to them and what their perceived value of the productions being what they were. I mean, I, I don't think that there is a large debate about people saying, oh, yeah, towards the end of the cart, the productions got a little too much the same to the effect that there are productions in the later era of the cart that did weird and unusual things. The redo of the gondoliers is a very good example of that in the 70s, the spaghetti eating and all of that. Um, but if you watch that clip, you'll sort of see that they don't think that um, they think that the value of their productions is so significantly higher than that of the Broadway pirates, for example. Mm. That Whereas is that completely shaped most young people's perception of pirates. Right. And listen, like, that that show got me into GNS. 
And I you like know. the shows done with the full orchestra, not with synthesizers. So don't think that I like am led astray by a, a new <laughs> version. But new versions are interesting. And I will tell you that Wilfred, <clears throat> when I saw in 2011, Jess, Jess Nicklin and Stephen Godward as Wilfred and Phoebe, not retrospectively, those scenes shaped my like perception of I this that. character. I was yeah. like, I was like, this is, this is wild. Like this, it was wild where they took those scenes. And I was so very impressed with seeing something like where he was acute and odious all at once. And it was yeah. very fascinating. He was very likable. I, but it was I... still completely in keeping with the text. And, and the thing, and the important thing is that you never felt like Phoebe was threatened or in danger. Oh my God, Phoebe and has that, to be and in And that was also like a big inspiration to me. And I think I took it a bit further than that, but that was definitely like a big inspiration for me and like how, oh, wait, he doesn't have to be really unpleasant. Uh, you know? Rachel, you, you did a wonderful Phoebe in 2013 and you directed Phoebe and Wilfred beautifully uh, when we did it in, in 2021. 20, so I think you've got, if your, your ranking of him high makes total sense, perhaps when I get the chance to play the character, I will find um, more of that. But I yeah. think that I, I will, my view of it is probably very similar to yours. And um... that, that exchange with Phoebe, and, and I, I will say, and I said this before, I, I, and I, I have seen, and the horrible thing is you see like people on Facebook actually kind of criticizing real life actors who would in like the ENO were like, oh, I didn't like this. But like, guys, they can see your comments. You do realize that. And but and, and like and but also like I think a couple of people criticized Wilbert. I'm like, are you kidding me? He was like, he was my favorite in ENO Yeoman. He was my absolute favorite because he not only was he absolutely every single note was dead on perfect. Like every and his lines were completely perfect, which was more than it could be said for a lot of them. I mean, it was the first night I saw, so, you know, it's fine. But like, he was, he had obviously done so much work and his music was dead on and he was so cute and likable. And he was very much like actually how Roly played it. You know, he was, mm -hmm. and, and I loved him and he, he had such an impact on me and his relationship with Jack Point in act two, they worked so well together. They had such a good chemistry in their duet and the audience loved them. And I just, I, I, I love, I love that Jack Point Wilfred section. So do you. I think that, that Jack that Point is... Wilfred section it's it's when Jack Point's going into that kind of big like rabbit hole, like, oh, I'm, it's, everything's awful. And then, and then, and then Wilfred's like, I often think I'd make a good jester. Just yeah. completely like he's hilarious. Absolutely miss, hilarious. Missing the missing the point of it, but they become best buds. Wilfred, mm. um, I having gotten to sing him recently. First of all, I I ranked this assuming Jealous Torments is in, though I gave it a one for narrative importance in the arias. <laughs> I'm like, well, I gotta do it. But yeah. um, so I love Jealous Torments, but um, the um, the music for Wilfred. Uh, which he normally wouldn't sing into the Aquaman finale is quite challenging. And I would uh, say mm. that um, poor Ken Sanford doesn't sing the right notes on um, B to her never watchful guardian eagle eyed. And when she feels something like those notes are so fussy. <laughs> and a lot of people sometimes take recitative as like, you could just speak it. I'm going to call out people yeah. for Dr. Daly again. Uh, the recitative Sir Marmaduke, that recitative is harder than it sounds. And mm. there are a lot of times you have to like, just, make the note happen before you've heard mm. the chord and i want everybody to just take some time to check carefully their 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 notes for roles like this also um wilford's got a beautiful harmony in tell a tale of cock and bull where he's like oh tell a tale of cock and bull where he's got this lower harmony than jack point which sometimes people don't even know is there they just sing the melody sometimes so um of course i'm a fuss pot wilford has some nasty entrances too like the orchestra comes in on the fourth beat and then he comes in on the end of four. <laughs> Bum, be thou at hand. Just there's like these weird little moments. And um, a real hard one is bump, 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 bump. Ingenuity is catching with a view, my king, and pleasing. So there's some, oh, there's some yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, really weird ones where you don't feel like you're on the right beat. So Wilfred's, mm. good luck. And I love you. Let's go to number six. Which, which is? is Grosvenor. Oh, okay. Which I ranked number four, which is, I think, performer bias. 
Yeah, I was um, going to say, I thought you would have, he would have come higher as a result of your mark. As, so I'm uh, surprised yeah. that, because we haven't talked about my number seven yet, and that surprises me, because I thought he, I thought Grosvenor would come above You know, that. that's very interesting, because th those are both parts I've played. Um, mm -hmm. And both parts I've played opposite you. But, but I mean, one Grosvenor, of, but one I would of say... Them, one of them I've played more recently, and I think that helps. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like... Yeah, I, yeah. I'm like Grosvenor, but we did that five years ago now. Sure. So I'm like, I need to do it. Like, give me it again. Like, I'm. Like, I mean, I I will say that I that having you play Grosvenor in 2018, and then Jen, Jenny Simmons playing Grosvenor in 2019, I don't think I, I people have ever been more spoiled, really, than to <laughs> have the, those two play because they were different but both just utterly perfect. She was and, uh, so good. It was, and the thing is you were both so fantastic in such different ways. And it, is, it just goes to show that there is, there is no one way of playing these roles. And you can go to the theater, see these parts played in a completely different way and still think that was perfect. Also, and I, and yeah. because like you, because the thing is, what Jenny did worked perfectly for her, and what you did worked perfectly for you. And it's all about the actor finding their own right way of playing it. So yeah, you can take inspiration from other people, but nobody could do what Jenny did. Here's another. <laughs> <laughs> Teasing Tom was a very bad boy. <laughs> a great big squirt was his favorite toy. He put live shrimps in his father's boots and sewed up the sleeves of his Sunday suits. He punched his poor little sister's words and cayenne peppered their four-post beds. He plastered their hair with cobbler's wax and dropped hot hippenies down their backs. The consequence was he was lost, totally, and married a girl in the corps de ballet. <laughs> That was, it, it was absolutely mind blowing. Her delivery of those poems and then your delivery of those, but like, it, one of my favorite memories actually is, is um, watching, I think it was the dress rehearsal or something, I can't remember, but watching you kind of do the poem and that silly voice for the first time and just seeing all the ladies in the chorus just like, just like it was hurting them not to laugh, and that was it was so much fun to watch. Well, I, yeah, I was being a, I was being a bit naughty. That was definitely a it case so where good. I was like, I want I, I have a way of doing this that I think I'm gonna save a little bit of the juice for the day of the show. Mm. So, so, and so remember that his dialogue with patience won the dialogue video. I yeah, I mean, I honestly would say Such that the, a good dialogue. the the greatest better than, better than Bunthorns, I think the greatest I think the greatest dialogue experience I have ever had is still you and I in that scene. So good. Which is, it, is that on is that, that on the GS Opera TV? That one. Yes, it's the so, Savoy Net 2018. So patients. watch watch both of those, and you'll see why we rank Grosvenor so highly. I think we move on to number five because I think Grosvenor yeah. we've we've spoken about him so much recently. We took yeah, and uh, and just see you 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 all all know why we love him. He's great. <laughs> but but here here could be an unusual one for some folks. Okay. But for us, yeah. I get why we both go pretty high. This is King Paramount. And yeah. You he's got my number seven, so seven. he's number five overall, right? Yeah, he's yeah. three for me. Now, Ooh. here is, now, of course, Grosvenor and Paramount are both Barrington roles. And they're very important to me. But I do think Paramount fits into that post-Mikado world where Barrington, at this point, is the star of the company. Mm -hmm. um, poor, poor Rosina Branchum's like, I've been here so long. <laughs> yeah. But but so, still, so like, here's, is here's the... my question. Here's my question for you because I remember we were really struggling with Paramount when we discussed the baritone arias, yeah. and we were saying how we struggle with him because he seems to be like a different person in every song. How did you how did you reconcile all of those different Paramounts into one person, and how do you now think of him as a character? I think that playing it only two shows gave me only my like first draft at what that it's gonna, it's gonna look like. But I do think he's somebody that um, he's operating in a place where I think that he's subduing the stakes for himself to different degrees in order to cope. 
And I think a good example of this mm, is, yeah, is, the, yeah, yeah. is the line where he's like, uh, well, when I consider that all of these immoralities are written by me at your command, why it's one of the funniest things that have come in the scope. But he's like, yeah. this is like the fact that you're making me do this evil stuff is funny. Like he's trying to get through yeah. with a smile and and to see that like he's I did give him a zest for life, though. Like he's kind of like mm. this life mm. is funny and weird. Like, I don't think he's lying in First You're Born about like, but it is a dark mm. song in spite of the fact that the message is like life's a joke. Um, but he does that wonderful soliloquy right before um, Lady Sophie comes in, where he's just speaking about like, I really don't think I should be doing this. He's like, he's figuring it out. He says, yeah, I know I like to look on the humorous side of things, but I don't think I ought to be required to write these things at, at their command. Ah, but then my daughter's coming home and he's like trying to figure it all out. And I think when Zara arrives, his brain gets like the missing piece that it needed. Where he's very he's... naive. It's almost like Zara's the mother and he's the son. Completely. He's, yeah. he's, he's very naive and like all of his kind of wrongdoings can be put down to naivety. And he actually kind of basically sends his culture and his country to its death. I, I but think, then you ne but, but but then like you never see him find that out. <laughs> no, but but that's that's for the audience. That's the dramatic irony yeah, of that whole yeah, ending. Yeah, yeah. The um, anybody who thinks you're overrating that show does need to see you and I in it because I do feel like that show yeah. like locks locked in mm -hmm. right around your aria and when we had our dialogue. Mm. Like that's a long haul, right? It says it's going to take an hour and eleven minutes, but you're going to love it. People say that they're like, mm -hmm. oh, you have to watch three seasons of this TV show before it gets good, but trust me, it's worth it. And I feel like yeah. Utopia Limited kind of has that accumulative effect. And But then, like, in the meantime, you've got, like, in every mental law, oh, let man. all your doubts take so, wing. You've got all the have made, have made the cream. It's like you've got a cavalcade of incredible numbers. But for, like, like yeah, the stakes aren't maybe I've, very I've, high yet, and do you don't know, know what the story is. But, oh, my God, you've got some delightful stuff to listen to before the so story starts. I, so just sit back. In, 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 my, <laughs> in, my, in my press release for it, I compared it to a Ziegfeld Follies, which is the sort of mm. review that things like the Busby Berkeley musicals that we've yeah. watched are based on. Like, these kind of, like, the numbers are set pieces. They're not necessarily yeah. to forward the narrative. And I think that if you if you say, oh, I don't like that song in Utopia because it's just only a good tune. And like, well, even if it's not forwarding the narrative, it's forwarding the, th the themes and the environment are narrative. Mm -hmm. That like, I love a big bloated super musical like this. So. So yeah, we have to get some clips of King Paramount and Zara's scenes in, and and yeah, I do think that now that I've played him, I'm you know me, I want to do that production again. I yeah, I send me I, send me your favorite clip of Paramount tonight. Okay, I don't think I can. I think I have things to do, oh. unfortunately, by regret. But I I can I can imagine it, and then you can imagine it, and then they can imagine it. But clips are coming from that show, and I think yeah. we'll, I have to get you over here to do it again. So um, let's go on. We have four more. Yeah. Here the question is, is and it's my top four the same as your top four it's the same top four because it's the four we haven't talked about yet your, it's my top four but your top four are the top four and my top four okay. have we've already done my three and four so okay um, right. so yeah next is my five which is your four which is giuseppe number four is giuseppe. yay so he is actually my number four so that's perfect i'd love to play giuseppe again i think that he is the best of the quartet um, his music is just and yeah because his his lines are actually not bad um, i think he has by far the best lines i gave him 14 for lyric style like, but it's just the music for me he was the only one i gave a 20 for to two for music his music oh my god so good he's in a he's in all the great numbers it's i think it's, it's a lot of it is just like the ensemble stuff he's in because actually his maybe his song isn't like anything to write home about but it, it is still good no, rage. But like it's more just the, the 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 stuff that he gets the stuff that he's involved in it's so good as i, as I mentioned before i found that the, a lot of times the value of a role comes in to play when i think about how much harmony it has to sing mm, and giuseppe yeah, yeah. is constantly singing in harmony yeah and i'm Oh my gosh, and I, I, it's every single one of these, and it's not because I'm on a high horse, but it is because at some point I learned I was doing it wrong. And now that I know, I want you to know, there are a lot of wrong notes everybody sings in this role. 
Really? And I think one of them that's nasty, the altos have it too, is congenial in his frame of mind, congenial in his frame of mind, and all natural flat. So people often sing the, as a flat both times. Um, and it's because they're on the recordings, they're usually wrong. And I love mm -hmm. that stereo <laughs> set I always talk about, those 60s recordings. I love the performances on them, even when the notes are wrong, because I love the characterization so much. So don't think I'm, oh, okay. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. being too critical, but they are. there's an echo chamber of wrong notes that I'm trying to avoid <laughs> in my life. Um, and I will say that on the new Dorley Cart recordings from the late 80s, early 90s or so, the rights, the, the, the rights are more notes. The notes are more right, but the mm. characterizations are sometimes not as vivid because they were like, let's get the notes right. And it sometimes feels like a little less lived in. And they weren't productions mm. necessarily. They were a lot of times they were recordings. So anyway, Giuseppe, um, major guy. I think we probably have little debate here. Let's, let's get to the top three, which are... Um, I do feel a little bad that I have a low, lower rank for this one, but again, these are the top 10 are all gnarly. This is the, the principal baritone of the Mikado. And no, what did you have him as? Seven, but you have him as three. It's but listen, three. But listen I, again, I haven't played him since we did the outdoor one. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and we didn't have much time to really get, and you know, I really hadn't appreciated how good these characters were when I did that. I barely directed that. Like I kind of count it as I've directed it just for my list, but like I I need to have another go. No, yeah, that. you like, you allowed us to just bring our exactly. Our I just I just do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, I I think that the only oh. score, the only score that he is a little lower than the people around him is music, which is a seventeen, and I only feel like that's the case because yeah, the auxiliary nice. baritone to me has better music. So okay, I have. Yeah, yeah. So I did, but I did rank them side by side. Um, no, I'm sorry. Mm nearly side by side. No, yeah. not at all. I shouldn't even be speaking. I'm looking at three columns of numbers, Rach, and sometimes I'm getting confused. But this is my number seven. That is definite. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I, gave, I, I only, thing is, I only gave him like a 15 for emotional dramatic impact, but I gave him like a 20 for lyrics and dialogue. And I gave him only actually only a seven for presence you, and narrative, you, but I gave him a ten for enjoyment because can we, can, honestly, come can on. we can we can we argue that that last mm. category also includes cultural impact? And I would argue that out of any role on this list, this one yeah. has the most significant cultural oh, impact. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's kind of what enjoyment is. I'm, I'm kind of taking in like the general enjoyment that I think I mean, it's the world like, tends to get like from these characters. The term of this character's name has become its own term in life. Oh yeah, yeah. Like it's like people people will use this character's name and have never heard of the Mikado. So they yes. they will they will mention it. So. Um, Having played this part though on several occasions, um, I've always loved the dialogue. Always, mm. always loved the dialogue. And will say that um, there are very few choices in, in GNS that I think are outright bad. But I think that giving each of the things on his list a different voice is a bad decision because it's really slow and not funny. Yes. Yes, because why, why would you? I think that it's one of those moments that is in just, just pork pie. It yeah. is just the character, the actor thinking that the character needs to do the lines funny as opposed to just say the lines. Yeah. It is remarkable in oh, genius how just... often just say the lines. And Especially they're... with this part as well. Oh my god! I mean, I'm going to do the dialogue video of this really soon. This is going to be. I'm so excited about that because I just I love like, this dialogue so I, much. I, but I, like, I... just say the lines. <laughs> just say the lines. Uh, so things like this. Um, this famous line, which I am thinking of, and it is this one. What is the line? <laughs> that was, that was the, 
I will. Is it the one that I, ends I, up? I, I know what it is. Don't, don't, don't tell me. Like... Don't tell me what it is. Don't say the punchline. I I thought about this over breakfast, and then I don't remember what it is now. Oh, that's a good line. Okay. Oh, that's yeah. I did know it. Sometimes it's the little details, and I think that in point of fact is the is the is the key here. Don't mention it. I am, in point of fact, a particularly haughty and exclusive person of pre-Adamite ancestral descent. You will understand this when I can tell you that I tra can trace my ancestry back to a protoplasmal primordial atomic globule. Consequently, my family pride is something inconceivable. I can't help it. I was born sneering. That sometimes takes a hundred years. I know, I, I, I don't like the, I can't help it. I was born sneering. I was like, I can't help it. I was born sneering. Can, you know, just yeah. say the line. <laughs> okay, so. Say it as if it's a human talking and he's actually meaning his words. I pretty, can't help it. I was born sneering. <laughs> I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna. I'm gonna tell you who tends to get this is tenors, because mm. I find basses, baritones, altos, and sopranos all have the for the basses and altos. And but tenors <laughs> get the dryness, don't they? Do you know? Do you know why? Because tenors can't act. No, they're what not I mean trying is, to act. A lot. No, of no, no. But, but, but the th yeah, I, I, but I get what you mean because like there's like. There's definitely like a, a bad spot in the middle where people have enough experience of what they think acting is that they do it all wrong. But it's actually often better to get people who don't really act at all because they just don't act. The tenor in the tenor in this in this show, mm. just saying his lines is the funniest thing in the world. It's the funniest thing in the world. The so absolute funniest. Let's thing. let's get to a role that maybe doesn't have to just say his lines. Here we go, number two. Number two is... It is Sir Despard. Okay, so... Um, Which is I, my number two. Number my, it's my number two. So we had his aria at number one for both of us. And I got to play this role in the inaugural Forbear production. So it is very dear to me in my mm. heart. And <laughs> it is... If it only had any demerits, it is also a size of the role issue because he is, he does have a subordinate role in the material in a way because he, he does the one thing he needs to do, which is switch mm. Robin to the baronet. And then he's kind of. But he is, he's talked about all the time. I know we, we often use that as a kind of. No, I get it. But I will tell like you. It makes up for it slightly. I want to do this part right now. I just yeah. did my solo show again, which has this little moment where I do Margaret into this with no chorus, which gave it a totally different color to not have the chorus in Moody yeah. and Sad. And then right into yeah. his right into his monologue, which I did 12 performances of. And now I did it the other day and I'm like, I didn't know how to do this dialogue, this monologue at all. I, and like, that is something that you should take time over, a lot of time, this dialogue, that monologue take a lot of time because honestly it's just like like it's it's the it's the actual kind of genuine cartoon villain that has like a genuine horrifying backstory that makes you feel very sorry for him and like what a gift of a role oh. i mean come on he's like he is a cartoon evil villain that has a tragic backstory and like none of the bad things are his fault. Yep. What I, a gift of a club. I, <laughs> I, I think he's, he's, we, again, I think we went hard on him in the Aria's video, but let me just say that um, apart from the Aria, again, that, that monologue, I feel like because the show I did, the solo show I do is like, is like abstract in its nature. It's a little mm -hmm. like performance art. That monologue carried that monologue for me felt the first time like it was high drama and not like low burlesque. Like it did feel yeah, yeah, yeah. like it brought out something where the whole history of what he's been going through was very clear. But then there's something I've always loved about his insanity, which is that he can bring it down. 
But what is a poor baron to do when a whole picture gallery of ancestors step down from their frames and threaten him with an excruciating death if he hesitated to commit this daily crime? But, aha, I am even with them. I get my crime over the first thing in the morning. Like, I'm going to let you in on something. I do good. It's deranged, though. It's like, I do good. <laughs> yeah, it, it's very, very nice. But also, he's, he's desperate for their approval, isn't he? The audience's approval. Um, I, I must say, oh. um, he also Ooh. has <laughs> a line too good to be believed. Does your honor know what it is to have a heart? My honor knows what it is to have the complete apparatus for conducting the circulation of blood through the veins and arteries of the human body. Great. It's great. Too I, clever I for its own good, but it's great. I, I do think that you you reminded me of something by with your acting, which is what was so good about that is that you you, you were you were being like fearless to express like I mean I mean I, th and I think maybe you could have even gone even further, but like you were fearless to like express the limits of human emotion which is, is something that I think a lot of directors are scared of. And what's so strange about GNS especially is that uh, I often get told things like, oh, there's only GNS, it doesn't have, doesn't have to be real. And it's all, all like, this isn't just just comedy melodrama. And it's like, but, yes, but, but where do you think that melodrama has come from? Like, where do you think these lines have come from? It's come from real people who who are extremes who do maybe experience emotions a little bit in a more of a heightened way to other people so like so this so you have to feel it i mean you know you know as an actor you don't have to genuinely feel what the character's feeling but you you have to understand that the that the character is genuinely feeling enough yes. to be saying the words they're saying and if you and if you just think that you can throw stuff away and it should just be oh i'm just going to do this move because it's funny it's like no like yeah it, like if you if you connect the moves to something real it will then become so intense that it is funny and that is where the humor comes from i, I, I sudden changes in emotion and like and like actually being real being very intense and not giving the audience a break like actually challenging the audience to well, face the this, this emotion, i, I you know? feel like what you're describing is exactly the mo of the show i just did because yeah. there really isn't too much time for the audience to breathe. And yeah. in this section, I had performed Jealous Torments very intensely. Then I did Mad Margaret where I cried and not of my own acting volition, but I got there, like I, I choked up and you, you'll watch the clip. And that goes right into Moody and Sad and then right into this monologue. And I'll see, if we, let's get the clip of the monologue if it's any good. I don't want to 
belabor it too much, but I also think that it's very important in Act Two that there is nothing uh, patriarchal and misogynistic about Basingstoke, because that was an important take from um, our interpretation of it in 2015. Yeah, because I remember that that's what I thought before you got you arrived in the country. I was like, oh, this is a horrible scene. I don't like this. But then what what you what what you three did with it is you really changed my opinion about that well yeah but you if, basically if... directed the sequence and it was like oh yeah it's a bit and thing is it doesn't an author it doesn't have to be the way you did it either there are actually several interpretations of it just being like 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 despar could just be like protecting her from herself because she is oh my kind gosh. Of ill like, <laughs> you know? like, like, she is genuinely like ill and she does need to be kind of given she, the safe word if, if she is know? saying yeah so so we did it we did it as a snm safe word yeah thing, but it could that's as also a, as so a valid. kinky yeah, thing yeah, yeah. but there's also a world where it's just like i don't want to relapse i don't want to trigger myself if you say yes. this it'll help and instead, like absolutely, the fact that he some productions he's just like basic stoke you little woman, and it's like ah, uh, no, and that's horrible. horrible. No, it's because like the first and foremost, Despard wants to protect Margaret and wants her to be happy, and so he is doing what she is saying to. Do you know? I'll tell you. Through. I will and tell. Yeah, because he is a bit stuffy. And like because he's kind of going into his new role, and I think he has gone a bit too far the other way, and is a little bit stiff. But he can, loves her. He can loves I tell her. you, um, the problem comes from people who deliver the line "Poor child, she wanders" like they're making fun of her to us. Yes. Oh God. Oh, and I will tell that. you. I will tell you who tends to do that: straight men and gay men, the two most notoriously misogynistic groups in the world. Whereas if you get a bisexual non-binary person to do it, you got a great Mr. Desbard. Speaking Basically, of- Basically, you if, you if you just cast all roles as bisexual non-binary people, you'll probably get a better show. You probably get people that like people, um, <laughs> that think women have value. Um, what? <laughs> no. They do. Do you, know what, do you know what you should do? Do you remember there's that story you told in the Princess Ida video? Um, you should tell us who who that person was that was not nice to you. You should tell us all who that person was, and you should just out them because they are. Misogynist. But the thing is, like, I. But the thing is, I don't think that th this person is by no means unique. It, and I have had that same conversation with so many people that they may as well just kind of represent a lot of the GNS community as a whole. So there's, you know, I I, I don't see it necessary to sing or fair to single that person out. Well, maybe I will. So let's go on to number one. <laughs> <laughs> let's go on to number one. Um, number one, it's unanimous. And I feel Absolutely like- unanimous. I by, feel... by several points, by by three points. For me. I have an 80 for this. What is the total? Oh, that's the to that is the total. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, a complete, a complete eight, a, a complete one of 100%. For the character that I think I've played more times than any human being alive. Yeah, me, me with Julia as well. And certainly like, more, we, we, yeah. we, we are like, come on, we're the grand, we are the grand duke. This is Ludwig, <laughs> by the way. Um, <laughs> Ludwig, yeah, which like we had the privilege of getting to do the longest <laughs> professional production of the grand duke since the opening in, in, in 1896. And we are obsessed with this show. And we got to do a really good one last summer we were very happy with and revisit those characters and you just got to do another one in another role so i know it's very much on your yeah. mind and ludwig is i think for me something someone says is it bradley says giuseppe has the most lines out of any character i'm like how is that possible it's gotta be yeah. ludwig. and ludwig for me hmm. is a part that i will somebody always... needs to count them can somebody count the yeah. words? Cool, cool. Someone who has time, can you do that? So, so Ludwig, um, because I am so biased, I'm glad we both agreed here because I know we didn't uh, agree no, about been, yeah. his solo last time. But tell me quickly, what is your, yeah. why is Ludwig number one? Look, look I, I would say that the only contender was Despard. And Despard is just, he isn't as present in the story. 
but I mean, I would say Despard is much more emotionally interesting, but that's probably the only advantage he has over Ludwig. So he is more of a complex, interesting psychological character. But Ludwig, okay, for a start, he's got the sheer amount of amazing music he has is just off the charts. His he is absolutely hilarious. His like to, his line to name but a few. Oh, there are plenty of people who eat sausage rolls. So we're not conspirators. Well, then they shouldn't. It's bad form. If, if one is offered a, a, a sausage roll, he must first ask himself, "Am I a member of the conspiracy?" And if he finds on inspection that he is not, he is he is, is obligated to choose some other form of refreshment. <laughs> and it's just nuts. His lines are so stupid. Like. And even when he's on stage just doing nothing, he's got such good stuff to react to. Like Julia's mad scene, he's just there like, huh, okay. And everything, he just takes everything in his stride and he's so fearless. And when he goes up to Rudolph and gets that plan in the scene, and then the way he deals with it as well, the way he deals with Rudolph is that, um, oh, oh, that's cheating. Well, so it is, I never thought of that. And just goes to go, no, 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 no. He's just so clever. He is like one of the cleverest. Is he the cleverest part in the canon? So I, is like super clever. I feel but like, like Ludwig is like so smart, you know. So, the, so, so there, there are certain scenes. There's the scene obviously between Grosvenor and Bunthorn, and there are the scene between the Patterman and the Tenor in the Mikado, where like a character is at the height of desperation trying to convince somebody of to do something else. Mm. And when Ludwig has that with Rudolph, it is sort of like the. Well, why should I kill you in making an affidavit that you've been executed? It's sort of like that if the character wasn't an idiot. Because the patter guy in, in the Mikado was like so lost that he's like not thinking two steps ahead. Whereas Ludwig is like, I could become the Grand Duke. <laughs> like, he is so, we, we are just, okay. So, like, this theater company, they are all going to be executed. And for a start, Ludwig is such like kind of a wholesome narcissist that all he can think about is how funny it was that he told. And when you come to think of it, it really is devilish funny. <laughs> and then Lisa's like agreeing, like, you know, he was so loved. And then so not only does that happen, they are all gonna die. He's like, right, now for my confession and full pardon. <laughs> so he should be the one that is like super anxious, super high stakes. And he comes to find the guy that should be executing him, the guy they've been scared of, like in floods of tears on the floor. Hello, who's this? <laughs> it's just, why do people not love this show? This show is so topsy-turvy. It is know, unbelievable. It... And then he gets the Greek song and then suddenly, but then as time goes on, he loses status and he gets pushed out of the show. He gets pushed out and of his own show, but that means... Yeah, and I, he acquires what, these wives and just, oh God, oh, another wife, another wife. Do you want to marry Mam or I, you? I'm getting tired of this. I, I kind of love something about it is that once the Greek song is over, I can kind of chill out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can kind of just like, I, I guess, but everybody else has to be dynamite. And I yeah. think that's one of the struggles of Grand Duke. And um, <laughs> we discovered what dynamite can mean in the act one finale last summer where i think the emotional oh. stakes never felt higher for this show i've tried Ooh. to bake them in but in terms of like ludwig losing the love of his life gaining the position that he only recently realized maybe he would want he didn't but then like... again why but here's a question for you why in your version of ludwig hmm. why doesn't he at that point just go I abdicate because obviously I love Lisa more. All of this is one of the things about this show and a lot of GNS that I think is very fascinating because people are always bound by their duty to follow some certain path. And that is the case. And they've all in... got flaws and that's fine, you know. And in these cases, if a character just had the bravery to go, I'm not going to do that. Like, I'm, I'm not going to make that happen. I'm going to choose mm. the thing that I want to do. You were talking about... Um, queer coding in Pinafore and how like Josephine is actually kind of one of the few characters that just chooses her path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, yeah. I'll just do that. And uh, though she, there's a technicality with what, um, um, there's a technicality with what Sir Joseph says to her that tells her this is okay. But at all events, um, Ludwig um, in that moment is so dazed and 
it just got such a high off of being like I played completely into like the I'm the Grand Duke. You saw the moment where I realized it. I didn't notice like like where I go. Mm. Oh man, I am the Grand Duke. And, and then and then and then Julia, she look believe me, I saw that as Julia because then she, who is kind of like an emotional kind of succubus, she sees that emotion and she like that fuels her. Yeah. You know, because she because she, because she just wants the drama. And that drama really riles her up. And then there's this moment where your heart broke and then I was just like deranged with power. I, and then I, we were walking around the stage together. And it was just like, oh, well, I, this is like dynamite. This I think so I think good. that I think that the reason to answer your question more directly, I think when you say that isn't in your part, you know, quite true. I, if yeah. you if you didn't say that and remind him, maybe it would be different. But yeah. the way Sullivan sets quite true is like, I'm like it's a foregone conclusion. Mm. This has to be the way it goes. But the way it got, felt really justified was leaning into the fact that we were going to be revolutionaries. So I don't think this one's mm. on GS Opera TV, but everybody should buy the Blu-ray and DVD of this show and yeah. watch how Rachel and I become like like a Vita, like at the end, we're like, we are in charge of this place. Mm. And even when Lisa's appealing to me with her eyes, I know that I owe it to the company to rule Fenning Hop Fenning the way we've wanted to rule it. The fact that Gilbert doesn't pick up on that thread at all is hilarious to me. Like the, but the thing that is interesting is that he goes, I wanted a wedding in Athenian robes and Ernest said no, because he's, cause he's prosaic. And now that we can have our way, we can be poetry and we can be Greek. And at least like, mm. his consolation prize is getting to wear the Greek costumes, which, oh, yeah. which is, creates a beautiful look for act two. And one of those, there's that mm. photo from the original production of that set. It's a photograph of the original set. Yeah. Oh my God, like, that set. Ooh. So, but yeah, like so Ludwig, he is, he is just such, he is such a flawed character. And I think flawed characters are very relatable. No. I think I think like people have a tendency in the community to say, oh, this is a bad character. This is a good character. Well, actually, no, they've kind of all got flaws and they've all got you and, know, you know, things we, that are good about them. And actually Ludwig, he does make some selfish decisions, but he's but human. At, at, the, at the end, he, re he, he gets relieved of everything and everything's fine. Mm. And... Fortunately, Rudolph doesn't seem to remember the conspiracy and he doesn't say, well, now that I'm the Grand Duke again, I will kill you all. He's, what is the last line of the show? The last line of the show is, but I'm not. Time's up. The act has expired. I've come to life again. The parson is still in attendance and we'll all be married directly. Hurrah. Hurrah. So that's good. Maybe we'll, well let's just call it there. Okay. Let's say that that's the yeah. Baritones. We baritones and yeah uh, uh because just a reminder that this exists that these these gondoliers dvds and um you, you should buy those and thank you for watching and remember to subscribe and like the videos and share the videos with your friends and if you don't like the video Share it with your enemies. I stole that of somebody. I, I like it. And we, I will, I think the next video after the, no, the next video after this one will be Quintet. So then after that, I think it will be that elusive Mikado dialogue video. So yeah, stay tuned for that. And we will see you on the other side.